If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump. We have to do it really fast because Justin has to get on a conference call in like 30 seconds. Uh, we interviewed Dr. <laughs> Andy, how do you say his last name? Gaplin. No, Galpin. <laughs> I knew you'd say it wrong. Uh, brilliant. Doc, Dr. Doctor G. Brilliant, brilliant dude. Love talking with this guy about muscle adaptation, fat loss, uh, technology, how it's affecting our fitness. He's the author of a book called Unplugged. Evolve from technology to upgrade your fitness performance and consciousness. Incredible fucking book that aligns exactly with the message that we've been promoting on Mind Pump for quite some time. It's now. a great book. You need to read it. He's also the host of the podcast, The Body of Knowledge, and his website is Andy Galpin. That's A N D Y G A L P I N dot com. And his Instagram page is at Dr. Andy Galpin. Galpin. Now that all being said, we do talk a little bit about recruitment patterns in this particular episode. I do want to mention we have the Prime and Prime Pro bundle. This is our correctional exercise bundle. So if you have injuries, if you have pain, you can't figure out why your shoulder hurts, if your squat is stagnant and you don't know why you're not able to generate By more power. By far our most revolutionary program that we have created to date, for sure. To date. So Everybody, we, doesn't matter what kind of what kind of program you're currently following, like Sal said, bodybuilding, weightlifting, you know, uh, obstacle course racing, CrossFit, CrossFit you name it, this Orange Theory, this is ideal for everybody. Within it comes an at-home test to assess you, so it's very individualized to each person for their specific goals and whatever they're doing as far as their workouts so make sure you guys check that out check it out it's at mindpumpmedia.com so without any further ado here we are talking to dr andy galpin oh boy he sounds more handsome than what he really is mm -hmm. wow. um that's ouch. <laughs> well no it's, it's good it's a good thing right adam hits on our guests a lot yeah. you know i'm exactly handsome enough that's yeah. uh, that's all you have I like to that. be that's good you know you, i know what that means by the way mm -hmm. it means you're not it's hard to navigate. Yourself? It's hard to navigate all the poontang that you're surrounded. So you're like, if I were more handsome, yeah, it would I would be, be. That's what I'm saying. You'd almost yeah. die. Yeah, that's exactly you know what, what I mean. I'm saying. Listen, yeah. there's water. There's water. They might and then suffocate you. And then there's vagina. a flood that you you know you can drown in. And Andy is almost drowning in the tang. Yeah, he's keeping his his, his nose above water. Just, just Let's, the nose. That's it. No mm. more handsome. Got to breathe right there. Got to breathe. So besides uh, besides pussy, what's the other motivation behind the field that you went into and studied? Uh, I don't know what other motivation there would be. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, when you decide that, how old are we, right? We were, we were about 17 to 19 years old. Uh, when what's, you your, what's your PhD 11? in exactly? Oh, no way. Oh, no, really? Yeah, I was uh, going to say, you lie. You did not wow. think it. What's your PhD in, Andy? Human yeah. bioenergetics. That's awesome. Fancy way of saying muscle physiology, mm -hmm. um, muscle chemistry, that type of stuff. So human performance. I mean, I think like most of us that get into this field, we were pretty decent athletes, but not good enough. Mm-hmm. Mm. You know, and you're like, you have that right level of incentive. You know, if you're shitty of an athlete, it's like, ah, I'm never going to get there. Like, I'm going to go be an artist or something. <laughs> yeah. That's funny to speculate on. Like, do you think if you were like this super gifted athlete that you would you would not gone down the direction that you went? Ooh, I don't know. Topic. Like, I think that has a huge part to do with it because for me, you know, if my training wasn't right, then that was the difference between mm -hmm. like playing a lot or playing a little or being an All-American or just being all car like things like that. You had to fine tune everything to the uh, yeah. last degree, right? And I just grew up in a culture, b both my family and the city I grew up in, where like if you lost, and it didn't matter like losing a sports game or losing a mortgage, like any form of loss, because you weren't didn't work hard enough, like that was just completely unacceptable. Uh, unacceptable. What like city? you could lose uh, a tiny little town called Rochester, Washington. So I guarantee you, not a single person in that town will listen to this podcast. <laughs> oh man, you'd be surprised, uh, dude. I was yeah. in Alaska, okay, it uh, in not in a place like Anchorage or a place anyone knows. I was in Skagway and some other place. We're huge and, in Skagway. Yeah, mm -hmm. we and I yeah. had we had the fans. Skaggers, yeah, the we Skaggers had, like us. I'm like, yeah. there's like 800 people here. It's how the, the fuck you know? Much? So you'd be surprised, man. Dude, so. how cool is it? The first time you guys started getting recognized in places like that. Yeah, it was. Oh, a, it was. Awesome. It was. It was yeah. a trip, and I remember. Uh, <laughs> With that came the other embarrassing moments, though, too. 
So we, and we've shared this before on the podcast, right when we started to get, you know, we get oh. fly down to LA, get recognized. It was like, oh shit, like people are listening to us. It's official, yeah. you know, and you know, you see your downloads and shit like that, but until it starts to connect like that, where you're out of your own major circle and somebody recognizes you. Someone besides your mom's that's right, job. Right, yeah, right. So that started happening, but then like the asshole moments would happen. Like we were at this like fitness convention where our, now that I've gotten used to people uh, running into us, I'm like, okay, there's probably Scary. a lot of people here that probably Especially know us. Especially because you're at a fitness convention and we justin and i are walking around this corner and like this group of probably 10 or 15 like hot chicks good looking girls oh they like are waving and, and waving us down and they come running over with the camera and they're like can we take a picture and i'm like yeah of course and adam, 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 <laughs> yeah. adam turns, yeah. no problem he here turns he's to like me and he goes yeah. of course yes. <laughs> i did not do that yeah you did but right? i did i did go in to put my arm around the girl and she hands me the camera to take a picture oh, of her and oh, all of her yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. it just so like i this. took a picture of <laughs> him taking a picture of them to to just you know capture just that moment deflated the shit out of i was me. working was on um i was working with kevin james the actor okay. um, <laughs> on um paul blart 2 the movie. Oh, no way. <laughs> we filmed all of it in My Vegas. My kids love that movie, yeah. <clears throat> so I was flying back and forth between Vegas and LA like, quite often. And uh, one of the times the limo driver picked me up and I was wearing a Barbell Shrug t-shirt, right? And uh, he picked me up and he's listening, boom, like he's listening to Barbell Shrug. Oh, wow. And he he's, so he's got uh, my little name, you know, when you get off the thing, it's like Andy Galpin or whatever. And he comes down and he has, he, he doesn't put the connection together at all. Oh, wow. And he's just like, bang it. And then he like looks and he starts looking down and he's like, wait a minute. And he was listening to an episode that I was on. And you were on there? <laughs> and he was oh, no like, way. holy shit. He's like, wow. he pulled out his phone. He's like, look, 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 look. And it's like paused like 30 minutes in or whatever. And he's like, holy fuck, I'm picking you up. And I was like, <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I'm big time. Nothing like that that's ever happened again. <laughs> but that's the one thing I can got. Like, we we consider ourselves E list E listers. Yeah, yeah that's, that, what, yeah. that's what uh, Vin, that's, Vince, Vinny said, right? Vinny told us that. Vinny Tortorich. <laughs> Natasha yeah, we, calls me E minus. E minus. E minus. E minus. You're getting there. She was like, you were G, and then you were on Rogan. Now you're E minus. Like, <laughs> ah, you bumped up a level. Now, yeah. How was it being on Rogan? That's like he's like the the king of podcasts. I really enjoyed that that episode, by the way. Yeah, you know, like. He's a he's a really awesome dude, and um, I li I like that format as you guys know. Like I like being able to talk for a long time. I hate the short little shit because mm -hmm. most of the people that are in the positions I am, like anytime you ask my opinion, it's extremely nuanced, mm -hmm. and, and I want the full time to be able to vet that and explain. And mm -hmm. I just want to be like, oh, keto's bad or keto's good. Mm -hmm. Like I, I hate that. So I liked having three hours to just really settle my position on things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But having said that, it's sort of funny because um, you know like. He just has a different environment for a lot of things. So it was like the whole time you're having two conversations, like you're having a conversation with him and you're having the conversation with yourself the whole time. Mm. Not that like you're nervous, but it's always like, should I have said that? Yeah. Yeah. Or you're like, <laughs> oh fuck. Like, and then he'll say something. You're like, what? Like, and you try to figure out where he's going. Yeah. You're like, cause he's sometimes he's, you know, out there yeah, like all of us are. Right. 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 Um, so you know, it was you know fun. Like, did did you didn't... notice like a big surge in uh, you know I don't know social media or and just just yeah, but like because he's got a big. He's it's got not a big... what people think. Okay. Oh like, wow. The book took off, of course. Um, so that launched, but it's not like you go from five thousand followers on Instagram to one hundred eighty-five thousand. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have these rocket of numbers. Like you definitely check your phone; it's blown up mm -hmm. for sure. But you know, like people like just think you're gonna have, like you have a million followers. Like no, no. Like, you gain like five thousand yeah. followers. How how long did you notice the impact? Kind of. I mean, I'm sure it's, it's still, still it's still rolling. I was gonna say you're yeah. probably still getting stuff trickled in, but yeah. did you see like this first initial like huge wave, and then now it's just like kind of keeps trickling in? Yeah, like it was pretty big, like from the second the show started because he goes live oh, mm -hmm. wow. so you're filming live and all of a sudden it's On like YouTube, your phone right? is like yeah. bing 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 just oh, start, awesome. you know going and that didn't really stop for a month or, or something like that oh wow how did he did he find you or did you yeah. contact him no, so okay. like that's like it's funny because i've answered that question more times than anything else like how do i get on rogan sure. it's like a, it's like that's what you're asking me just come out and say like how do you, <laughs> right, you right. give me joe's phone number that's what you're saying <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah that's what you're saying uh no he reached out to me oh very cool that's which great. i think is the only way you get people like in that uh position their attention Mm -hmm. Now you have to do some shit. Is that, that why Oprah is not responding to my emails? <laughs> no, that's totally separate. Okay. Issue. Yeah. yeah, it is totally yeah. separate. Oprah now, doesn't like did he get a dad bod? Did he get a hold of your book ahead of time? I he mean, didn't even know until like the last five minutes of the show. He's like, "Oh, you have a book out," so it had nothing to do with the book. Oh wow! wow. It was completely Fucking serendipitous. Like wow. super lucky that it. I was on Rogan two weeks after my book came out. Wow. Mm. Yeah, that was not. Like that. I bet that was, you see athlete. I mean, everybody training? has. I was interested. In? Everybody yeah. has to think the same way I thought, which is I thought that was all. That part was of the, the reason. Yeah, why that you was part on. of the launch and the strategy, no, which is why we didn't even talk about the book until the last like five minutes of the show. Oh. Everyone's like, "Oh, your PR people." I'm like, "Fuck them! They didn't do anything." 
Yeah. Like the wow. book published? No, like I have done like none of the stuff that we've. It was from uh, it was uh, the planets were in an interesting alignment that day. Science. Yeah. 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 No, wow. no, the universe, energy. Like yeah. he just came upon. Jesus. Um, <laughs> it's sort of funny because I mean I'll just give the secret away here, exclusive. You know to. Wow, right. We media. love those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know when I look at situations like that, and I know you know because we're all elift people, right? Right. Yeah. So we have that same thing of people wanting to get on your show, I'm sure. Right? sure. And it's like you have, okay, people wanting my attention. And I looked at the things like, what gets my attention and what pushes me away? And I'm just going to do the same thing for him. Like, I'm not going to do the shit that the normal people do that I get irritated by. And I'm going to do the things that actually when people get my attention. And that is far, first and foremost, like you have to do something of actual quality and interest. Like If, if you're not doing something super interesting, like go yeah. fuck yourself. You're not going to get in an right. interesting place. Mm-hmm. You're not there yet. Right. Exactly. Like you right. don't honestly deserve. You got to work your way up. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, okay, I want to do that. And I looked at how I handle my social media and I looked and I'm like, well, he's not super active on Instagram and he's not super active on Facebook. And he's said this a million times. Like how many times has he talked about loving Twitter? Right. All right. So I'm going to go there. Well, I had like a thousand followers on Twitter. I didn't have a huge following, but he doesn't care. Like if you notice the guests he brings on, he doesn't care about those things. Right. So, right. He wants quality. Yeah. Right. Or somebody that's really doing interesting, something interesting. Something, yeah, doing and something. so I just made sure that like my Twitter page, I didn't like for the record, I didn't build my Twitter page just to get Joe Rogan's attention. <laughs> right. But it was like, okay, this is a good way to think about how you handle your social media. It is like, I want if someone, because what happens in situations when you get people's attention like that, you get one chance. And they're going to give you like a quick scroll through like, all right, what's this dude all about? Mm -hmm. If your last seven tweets are like something irrelevant about your dog or politics or something, they're going to be like, well, I'm not going to, this is a muscle physiologist. But then his last 12 tweets were about the Seahawks. They're like, like, (laughs) whatever, like I'm out. Right. Right. So I I just make sure like the vast majority of my stuff is really related to what I do. Like, oh, here's this fiber type paper, this new thing we learned about how muscle grows or why it shrinks or something. And I still tweeted about other shit if I, if I wanted to, but I made that my profile and I made sure that when I did stuff on there, it was mostly focused on what makes me unique and different. So if he did or anybody else that's important happen to scroll past me, they're going to be like, oh shit, this person's doing pretty cool research. Well, it's because your attitude towards social media is business, is pr- you know promoting your business, helping you yeah. grow your audience in that particular sense. Most people's social media is well, are distractions. It's actually, it's yeah, quite, I, don't, I don't have any business at all. Like, I don't have a single thing of business. I, I don't have a single newsletter or mailing mm-hmm. list. Like, I don't know anything business-wise. But it's the same point. I kept it genuine. Like, I want to put on there what I actually do and what I find helpful. So if people are following me, I'm going to do something that I genuinely think that they might be interested in and helpful. And if that means I have a 1,000 or 600,000, it doesn't matter to me. I don't really care about that type of stuff. Let's get into this a little bit because I already, off air, I asked you a few business-type questions. And <laughs> you, you were- saw me almost throw up? Yes. Yeah. You were- uh, you, I, you can tell you're almost allergic to a lot of these fucking questions. Like, you don't want anything to do with it. I asked the sales and marketing thing, and you're like, bleh. You know, yeah. I asked a business, another thing, partner, bleh. You're just like, I don't, you have no desire to do that. So what is it that motivates you? And then also, on that note, how the fuck do you financially survive with that attitude? How, what if, how have you been successful? Well, you know, uh, so the financial one is, is, is an interesting one. And, mm. like, I have a full-time job. I'm tenured. I'm done there and I don't get paid much. You can look up my wages if you want. That's all, you know, public information. Um, and so I, like, that's just not a huge part of my life. Um, you can look at that and I can survive financially, but I'm also not, that's not how I, like this stuff is not how I feed myself. Mm-hmm. I don't pay my mortgage because of my book sales. If, if I get a book sale, then that's just going to allow me to buy more plane tickets to come up to San Francisco to work with Jimmy more mm-hmm. or whatever. So I don't, I don't have those things. I'm not trying to build a company and make sure I have a retirement on things. So I, don't, I just have a totally different aspect of, of what I do for a living. So that's my real job. Now, of course, all of us like to make more money. Like that's, more, that's, that's great. But my philosophy mm-hmm. has been like if you do something that's genuinely good, you're going to make money. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not going to try to scrape every single penny out of every single thing I do because I feel like if you do something really, really good and it's worth $10 million and you make a million off of it, well, a million dollars is still pretty awesome. Mm. And eventually, like what's, what's happened recently is people have come to me being like, I love the business aspect of it. Why don't you let me do that and you do what you do? And, and I'm like, that, oh, perfect. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I want to do. If you want to handle all that shit, and that's why I have Josh Embry and the guys at Body Knowledge, he's like, you got amazing stuff here, dude. Like you're sitting on a gold mine. You just do you. Let me put business behind it. I'm like, fine. Hmm. Like I'm not scamming people. I'm not doing anything disingenuous, but I'm not doing any of that stuff because it drains me emotionally. It drains my time. Like it drains all that stuff. And I'm like, I don't want to put myself in a position to fail. Like why try to learn a bunch of shit 
I have a PhD in muscle physiology. Why why go spend time trying to learn advertising and marketing? So tell That's me, just stupid. That, tell me where this tell me where this attitude has benefited you, and then tell me where it's hurt you. Well, it's definitely hurt me in terms of I'm sure I could have made quite a bit more money. <clears throat> like I'm sure that I could have optimized book sales and, and figured out ways to do that and made a lot more money, got a lot more attention. Like anyone that's business that'll hear my attitude is like, well, that's, yeah, but what you don't realize is if you spend a little bit more time on the business then your reach will go further and then what you want to do is easier. And I totally acknowledge that. Uh, so it's clearly going to hurt me in those ends. Like if you look at my social media, I don't have a huge following, you know, relative to what it could be. Right. Um, some other people in my field have a digit more than me and things like that. So it's, I think it obviously it hurts opportunity. Uh, it hurts travel. It hurts is her income, things like that. But where it's helped is it allows me to actually keep focused on doing the things I want to do mm -hmm. and allows me to do stuff and produce more of what I do, generate more content and have better relations with people, which, uh, and most importantly, lets me like go to bed at night. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I feel I'm great here. Like we got a paper out, no one will read it, but I was really happy about it yeah. or whatever. So you have to find a balance between, yeah, you want to work hard and, and being uncomfortable is important and you do want to do things just because it's not comfortable, you shouldn't avoid it. But at some point you have to be realistic also in being like, this is not worth any, like the, the amount of discomfort is worth such little gain that maybe I need to step outside here and give up that. If money is the only thing I'm working for, well, that's a fucking stupid. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, don't do that. That's so. a, that's That requires a, a good deal of uh, self-awareness. There's There are some very intelligent people out there with great information but it never gets out because they don't understand what you understand which is I'm going to do my I'm going to do what I'm good at and if I want to get it out I'll have people who are good at it mm -hmm. help me do that part right which I think I wish more people would do because then we would get better information that's out there because unfortunately the ones that are doing such a good job of especially in the fitness world mm -hmm. people who do the best job of marketing information and reaching people are putting out shit yeah. yeah, you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like you know as well as we do, the vast majority of mainstream fitness information is garbage. Right. Even, whether it's training, nutrition, supplementation, it's not only is it wrong, but it's bad. It's right. opposite of uh, of good. Well, honestly, like if I'm being real too, that that is a huge reason of why I re I react like I do to things like that. Because whenever I, f I see things like that, like wow, how's your your funnel set up or your your trip? And I'm like, God, like fuck you. <laughs> like, I immediately think you're trying to do some shit that's not good. Yeah. Right, right. And that's not totally true, but the vast majority of people, it is like that. And so I'm like, I'm not playing that Snake game. Snake oil salesman, yep. Exactly. Like, I'm not trying to just trick you into buying an extra thing so I can, you know, buy another uh, another uh, Lexus or what, like, I'm like, ah, oh, like, don't do that. Mm -hmm. This field is this field is full of way too much of that shit. Mm. It's not helping people. It's making shit worse. And we're end up in this, you know, quote unquote, like, here you go, Chris Bell, like land of confusion. Mm-hmm. Mm. So I'm like, yeah, like I don't want to contribute to that at all. Like I want to be the exact opposite. And that's why we made our podcast. Because I'm like, I want to do the shit in the middle that goes, hey, this is all bullshit. This is where we can actually land on some settled things. And here's how you can approach yourself so you can actually get better. Um, now, like there's a balance again between that because if you don't have any industry here, then we can't actually progress as a field. Mm. So I just don't want to contribute to noise at all in this area. So I'm like, I'd rather just step the hell out and not be part of it. It's You have a genuine passion for what you do, which I, comp I uh, respect and admire, and I wish there were more people uh, like you um, in that regard. Was your, when you were talking earlier and talking about what drove you to learn what you did, it was initially you alluded to the fact that it was to help you become a better performer sure. and athlete. Uh, you were, were you also deep into the fitness industry at the time? You, you have a lot of knowledge about you know old school bodybuilding and yeah. that whole market. I know we talked in the past. Was that something that influenced you as well early on? No, no. Like, uh, I mean, I grew up in, a, in that country town and I started lifting on a universal machine that my dad bought and the concrete weights. Like, you guys remember those, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, when I was 13 or <clears throat> something like that. And that's just, again, because the culture I grew up in that city, like, if you wanted to be good at sports, you lifted weights, right? And everyone was just kind of getting started. So I started there. Um, and then, you know, I, I went on, I played college football. And then we had no strength conditioning coach. We had no help there. It's like, you're just on your own. Uh, and so it started to build from there. But, I, you know, I was like, most of you probably were like, all right, there's a muscle and fitness magazine. Like, all right, let's do that workout. And it's like, you just get ingrained in that stuff. And then as I, as I went on through my career, like, I was like, man, there's some pretty smart people that just because this book is 20 years old, maybe, maybe there's some good shit there. And I just started looking back and being like, this is a really cool field. And it's a really cool story. And then especially when, when I did that episode for our show, we trace the history of these fields and then you started getting back and you're like, ah, 
That makes sense now. Like that all makes sense now. So what were what were some of the things? Do you remember those times when you had some of those moments where you were maybe following the routine of muscle and fitness, and then you read something from 30 years ago, and you're like, oh shit, they did it differently. Let me try that. Ooh, that works. Or did you have a lot of those moments? I remember myself. I had a lot of those moments where I just had these realizations. <laughs> You know, throughout my I think, personal you know, honestly, I probably started off doing the workouts that were on the side of the machine. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. You remember back <laughs> yeah. in the, the, the little red where you're supposed to be working? Oh, that's where I'm supposed to feel this, it. Yeah. And then this. Exactly. Yeah. And it would be like, do three of these and 10 of these. And okay. Like you're reading this thing as you're doing the rep. And you're like, all right, I guess that's what I'm doing. And when you're 12 or 13 or 14, like it all works. Right. Like, this is great. And then until you have a shoulder surgery at 15. And you're like, <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. Right. <laughs> all right. And then, um, but I just like to, you know, I like the the idea of of being better than everyone else. Um, and I like the idea of being like, I'm going to win because you aren't taking the time mm. to read as much as you can to do this 5% better. And I'm going to invest that time and I'm going to get 5% better and I'm going to win. And so I don't have any of those moments um, really that jump to my mind. But I do remember, for example, going up and spending time with Bill Gillespie at the University of Washington. A legendary guy, a uh, world record holder in a lot of stuff. And literally just like, cold calling him out of the blue and being like, Hey, can I come up and like job shadow you? And he was like, here he is like a world champion, the head strength conditioning coach for a pac 10 school. And he's like, yeah, sure. Come up. So like I go up there and I'm walking in like, Oh my God, the university of Washington facilities. And he's doing a workout and he's got a mouthpiece in and he's doing dumbbell presses with like 180. And I'm like, Holy shit. And I'm like, okay, this is cool. And that was just like a huge leap in my, like, you got to really, like, you're not, these magazines are not worth, like, you got to really start mm-hmm. paying attention to people that really know what they're talking about. And then everything from the world's strongest man on TV, and you're like, wait a minute, like, I'm not doing anything like that. Okay, I could actually see. And then I got exposed to weightlifting, and the weightlifting really took everything off for me. Weightlifting so. is, uh, I've said this many times on the show, if you were to look at all and take like just all forms of resistance training, you know, that big umbrella, yeah. including powerlifting, bodybuilding, what all those, all of them, weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting, in my opinion, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, I think probably has the most well, science. I can't correct you, bro, if it's your opinion. Yes, well, <laughs> well uh, I think it probably has the most science uh, applied to it in terms of performance with resistance training, mainly because it's been an Olympic sport and because it was state well, funded. Well, it depends on what you mean by science. So in terms of like peer review publications, it's 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 hypertrophy by a, by a landslide. But in terms of science, like if you look at what the Russians collected in terms of that's science, what I mean. Like, it was a state. Oh my god, no yeah. one put even remotely close to that much attention right. to it than weightlifting. I mean, You're when the, right. when that I, when the Soviet Union you know collapsed or whatever, like it was like we we just learned a whole shit ton of. Oh my god. Yeah. yeah, I mean, pick the name, like spit out any Russian name you want, and they probably have a book out. Mm-hmm. And it's probably like 30 years of training logs. And, and better than so much of the stuff that we had. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like, so in that terms, and I, by the way, I do consider that to be research mm-hmm. as well. And so I would agree with you. Uh, we, we learned, wh- like the whole concept of periodization, Metviev, like Matt Viev, like all those guys, we have these concepts of periodization because of, them. Because of the Russians, yeah, for the most part. Yeah, it's, it's cliche a- to say, but it's totally true. Like all those guys, and you look at the contributions of Rikoshansky and all these people coming over, and you're like, Oh, yeah. Okay. Like it's fair. It's a fair cliche. That's where I really first learned that, uh, you know, these lifts and training was as much of learning a skill as it was just breaking muscle down and causing growth. Oh, sure. And, yeah. and they were experts at that. They would go and lift, you know, sub, you know, high intensity, like moderate intensity, but just practice these movements over and over again yeah. and get really fucking good at them and really strong. And when I started applying those on myself, on my clients, it was like, shit just explode and then you learn about how the central nervous system adapts and all that stuff so yeah very very awesome stuff let's talk a little bit about your book um what motivated you write your book unplugged which if you don't mind giving a little uh, just kind of a rundown of what it's about and so the book is called unplugged evolve from technology to upgrade your fitness performance and consciousness and it's not an anti-technology book really it's more of a book of how to appropriately use fitness technologies and mm. how they can screw up your training actually mm-hmm. and we don't really it's not an extensive like here's a chapter on Fitbit and here's a chapter on HRV. Like it's not a dive deep. It's it's more of a higher level of saying it doesn't really matter what the technology is because these arguments are going to hold the same weight. And I'll can I'll use some of these technologies as examples to make it easier to understand. But everything from HRV to a mirror to using your phone to you you know like any of these things these are all technologies and sometimes they can be helpful for your fitness and your training and sometimes they can be harmful. And the reason we wrote the book is. To to not be against those things, but to simply say, you need to be conscious about this approach because it can suck the training out of you and it can make you actually get worse if you're not really being aware of what's going on. 
And that's the surface, the high level uh, reason we wrote the book. Um, Brian McKenzie, who, whose last book was a bestseller, he started CrossFit Endurance. Uh, he and I wrote the book. Um, it was our idea and mostly Brian's idea um, because Brian was, you know, he was out for a run was one of, with one of his athletes and the athlete was like checking his heart rate and he's like, I'm 165 or whatever. And Brian wanted to pick up the pace and the guy was like, well, you know, I can't go to 167 because I'll blow up. You know, he's like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's like, we're talking right now. Like, well, who cares? And he's, he was so worried about the data and so worried about the technology and he wasn't paying attention to his own physiology. Mm-hmm. And then from my perspective, I work with a lot of these companies up here in, in, in the Valley, all these tech companies and these wearable EMG software companies and all this fancy fitness stuff. And you guys would be shocked at how inaccurate they are. And so I was just getting so pissed because I'm like, don't don't outsource your coaching to this technology that's wrong. Like, it's fucking terrible. And we got to, like, this, it's not telling, it doesn't understand context. It doesn't understand all these things. So it's not that you can't use all this stuff, but you just need to be aware of what you're actually doing. So that was the, the basic idea of what the book is. Now, it's, it's interesting hearing this from a scientist because here we have devices that give you or supposed to give you objective data, and you're saying to go more, to be also subjective in the sense of you know, pay attention to your own body. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and so it's not completely be one way. I'm not going to say throw all science or technology out. That's, that would be a bad approach, mm-hmm. right? But, I mean, pick your, your favorite fitness technology. It doesn't matter what it is. Well, let's um, let's talk about one of the ones that. So, I finished reading a book called uh, "Irresistible" by Adam Atler, and a lot of uh, the stuff in there I've been told is similar to uh, your book, Unplugged. They have similar uh, ideas. One of the he ones probably stole all the good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. He did. Even what, if he was out before, so it doesn't matter. He stole it. <laughs> one of the things that I actually struggled with that that they said in the book uh, was they they weren't fans of the Fitbit at all. Yeah, and I highly recommend it to every client that I ever train. Now. I also use this as a tool to make them more aware sure. of the things going on with their body. So I coach through that. Yeah, that, uh, that's the fundamental difference. And I can, mm. I, like, I, I'm sure you have a bunch more to add there, but I'm going to stop you right there on purpose. Okay. To simply say that, like, that that's the key. Like, that's the piece that's missing, though. If you're just getting out the Fitbit and then collecting the data and then have an algorithm designed to program, or you let the client go by themselves because of that, that's the mistake. It takes that second level, and that's really what we're talking about is you have to have that second level of, of using that technology to then enhance their own understanding. Right. Mm-hmm. Because if you look at simple things like I was talking to Jimmy's class last night about motivation, and depending on what study you look at, something like 90% of people stop using their Fitbit after a few months. And so does that mean don't use Fitbit or not? Right. No, it doesn't mean that at all. No. So here's an example. Like if you start a client off and, and you ask them, for example – like how physically active are you throughout the day? And they think they're a seven out of 10. Right. And you look at the Fitbit and you go, dude, you walked a thousand steps today. Right. Yeah. And they're like, shit. I mean, that's a fantastic use of generating awareness, generating calibration. Mm-hmm. There is some um, accountability that can be held there, especially if it's like, we're all three going to start a new workout and we're all three going to wear it. And like, these are all good, but you have to move past that eventually. Oh. You know what this reminds me of? It's just right one there. metric. You know what this reminds me right. of? 100% reminds me of uh, when people learn how to track their food. Mm-hmm. And they learn how to count their calories and track their macros. Exactly, and which is important. S- but which then is they a, stay there. You, right? it's, a, be, it's yeah. a part of awareness, uh, especially if you don't know what's in food. Yeah. And but people get stuck there, and then they become these IIF lamb robots where that's it, and they stop listening to their bodies. Right, and, and you stop right there, and then because you don't even want to talk about the accuracy of those things. Right. They're 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 completely inaccurate, right. but that doesn't mean you can't use them because the accuracy doesn't matter when no. you're just learning calibration. What they're good using. at is consistency. That's about it. Right, right. Exactly. They're they're generally fairly reliable. Right. They're consistent. And so let's take advantage of the part that's good, but let's not become reliant upon the bad part. Mm-hmm. And that's your fault as a coach mm-hmm. if it fails because you, the expert, you, the person they're giving fucking money to. Right. Should have known that. And that's your fault. That's not their fault. Oh, they got unvoted, maybe they stopped doing the workout. Well, that's your fault. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why they're paying you. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's just the stuff we, we want to talk about is like, okay, what happens with gamification? Why do they release a new app every six weeks? Why do they have a new software? Well, because they realize you're going to be bored of shit after a few weeks. Yeah. And you stop doing it. I'll get you re back in by adding this new tab, this new like button, this new whatever, right? Yeah. And so let's use it to our advantage, is all we're saying. Um, so, you know, like, the, I mean, go over a hundred examples of this, but you're getting the basic point, food tracking, all this stuff. It's completely inaccurate for the most part. It's unusable, but it can be helpful as a certain place. But if you don't, you can't match that with feeling perception. 
So with your clients, I'm sure as they're going along, it's like, do you notice how you're feeling better? Do you notice how you're right. sleeping better? You're making, you... you're connecting the dots yeah. for them. And then they go, oh, okay. And then eventually they stop using the Fitbit or they stop caring or some maybe suck to it, but that's not the only thing they're concerned. Well, so, and I like that too, because it's like, you, you don't just demonize the company no, uh, because cares? what they're trying to do is, is keep and retain these, these people to, to keep using them. But the, mm -hmm. you know, they're not coming from a coaching background. So, you yeah. know, that's the, the, the importance there is to be able to, you know, take your client and lead them to this and, and, Right. build that understanding there so tools can do either tools like this can either make you more aware or they can actually take you aware uh, excuse me t take you away from awareness absolutely so like social media is a great example i could go on social media and we're not even talking about fitness here i can go on social media and bring uh, more awareness to what may be happening with my groups of friends what may be happening with the world you know all these different things or i can go in there and distract the shit out of myself and completely become unaware about what's going on. They right. can use it in both different ways. And the same thing I see with some of these fitness tools. And there's this, there's this misconception in, uh, in the fitness, you know, world, weight loss world, whatever you want to call it, wellness, that more information is going to solve the problem. Yeah. yeah. And good luck. It, it, <laughs> and and I'll we, good we, luck. we live in the age of information. It's out there. It's all yeah. out there and it's easier to get to than ever before. But I laugh because <clears throat> there's studies that have shown, not that we need studies as coaches, we've seen this, but there are studies that have shown that more information doesn't necessarily mean anything. There's been, there was a, there was, I don't remember what it is. I got to find, find it because I've, I've referenced this several times, but there was a, I want to say a town or a city that passed a law. They wanted to like get everybody to lose weight. So they're like, okay, what's the problem? People eat too much. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to pass a law. Uh, where all restaurants and fast food places have to post in big numbers the calories yeah. of the meal. And this should help because now people are going to know, right? Now people are going to know if I eat this burger instead of the salad, I'm eating 300 more calories, so I'm going to lose weight. So they did this. They put it out there, and they found that uh, it uh, caused people to eat more calories. They actually studied and saw people's behaviors yeah. and found that people – Ate more when they were provided with this information. Now, why a lot of people are thinking, well, why? why? How could that happen? Well, here's what happens. If I'm going into this fast food restaurant, and I really don't give a shit about losing weight. It's not on my, it's not my goal. It's not my, I don't have the awareness about it, not something I'm focusing on. And I look up on the menu and I see, you know, cheeseburger, you know, 400 calories, double cheeseburger, 600 calories. I may say to myself, it's only 200 more calories. Right. I think I'll go with that one. So they're doing, the opposite. And this is what can happen with information. Yeah. I mean, we have a story in there. Um, well, we have a section called Tool But Not Taskmaster. Ta Taskmaster. There you go. It's just the same way. Um, Tim Ferriss wrote a section at the end, which is his like top eight ways to use tech when you're training to monitor your own training. And one of his major points in there was saying, like, every time I've come to the wrong conclusion in my training, it's because I collected too much data. Hmm. Mm. And that's like his point number six or something like that. So there, there's one freebie for you out there. You're going to have to buy the book to get the rest of the seven. <laughs> Tim Ferriss exclusive. You know, it's <laughs> it's what's interesting about all of this is we've all heard the terms, go with your gut, you know, listen to your body, you yeah. know, you know, uh, listen to your feelings. And uh, for a while there, science said, that's stupid. What do you mean go with your gut? You know, th this doesn't exist. But what's funny now is studies are showing that on a subconscious level, well, just, just the brain itself, it aggregates way more information than you could ever be aware of or perceive. Yeah. And so what you feel is a gut feeling that you may attach some kind of mysticism to, in reality is your brain nudging you to make a decision based on all this ridiculous information that you couldn't possibly mm. even I think a new paper just came out in New Zealand looking at power lifters and they used uh, basically, um, it was an exercise selection <clears throat> study. So they chose the exercise for the day. I think they kept the program about the same, but they chose what exercise they got to pick. So I think this is where they, they, they had like a hinge programmed or something, and they, but they could pick whatever hinge they wanted. And so they had that autonomy in that. And I believe the ones that had the autonomy had a much higher success rate. Strength mm -hmm. got much higher. And there, there's a fine line there because you can lie to yourself. Sure. And that can be abused. So you don't want to just completely like throw out all technologies and just like do whatever you feel like when you go to the gym. That's mm -hmm. probably a very bad <laughs> approach for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> but like there is something to be said for a little bit of both. I mean, we have um, the classic mistakes that, yeah, uh, my wife works uh, in elementary school special ed, and every one of her colleagues are obese, right? And every single month they do a, a fat loss challenge, and whoever loses the most weight like wins the pot, right? 
And you can see where this is going. Like they're all 100 pounds overweight and the person who loses like two pounds wins. Mm-hmm. And then that's also because like, all right, Justin wins this week. He lost, or this month, he lost two pounds, but you two fuckers gained 12. And then next week, you're, next month, you're going to win because you, you're down two months next month. But like overall the months, they keep all gaining weight. <laughs> oh, like wow. they, they're getting higher and they're all using Fitbit and they're like, well, I hit my 10,000 calories today. All right, great. I'm going to get a donut today. I'm going to get ice cream because I got my Rewarding 10K in. themselves, yeah. Yeah, and you're like, this, this is a bad use of the technology, mm, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, Well, so it, it really- It's uh, a false sense of health. And do, you think, do you think that's more or less? What do you think right now? Do you think more people are using it? I think it? more people are using it and getting more benefit than, I think these people are yeah. probably not, I think more people are probably using it as a start. But what happens is, I would say the vast majority of people are getting massive improvements in their health the first three months, and then after a month, three or four or five or six, they're right back to where they started. Well, when you look at the motivation, if, it, if, if that's true, what you say, then it really isn't because that's about the same pattern that somebody who hit New Year's resolution says, hey, I'm going to work out it's exactly and right. starts doing mm-hmm. it without any tech. It's the, it's, they yeah, go yeah, for yeah. three months and then they fall right. off. It's motivation, right? It's right. behavior change. Like that, yeah. It doesn't matter if that's tech or not tech. Yeah. If you want a sustainable pattern over time, like you're going to have to create something besides your watch. It's, it, just, it's just not working. A hundred percent. And it's it's the false uh, paradigm of motivation that we have in fitness right. where I need, to be, I need to be motivated. If, and if I'm not motivated, I can't do it. Well, behaviors, uh, long-term behaviors don't depend on motivation. That's right. At all. I mean, I get up in the morning and I brush my teeth. I'm not motivated to brush my teeth. I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm going to brush the fuck out of my... I just brush my teeth. Pre-workout for your teeth brush. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it's just... It's just what I do. Yeah. And so these behavior changes and the fa- the problem is uh, the fitness industry understands and understands the motivation factor and knows they can get people or trick them or whatever into doing something for a short period of time. Absolutely. And that's easy money. The hard problem is how do we get people to change for reals yeah. permanently? Yeah. And I, I you you you've now, you know, said the word awareness several times or becoming more aware. And I really think that uh, that that's what it's all about. But the problem is People are, they're in a state of unconscious incompetence. They, mm. they don't know, you know, when you tell yeah. someone, listen to your body, they don't even know what to, to listen yeah. for. They don't and, even and know. And then when they think about that, they think about all these biohacker guys, right? Yep. Like they must know everything about their body and they're just like adding all these new technologies to their body and they're not really listening to the signals of their body. Yeah. Is this sort of, uh, so this book, have you like, were you inspired a bit by this book by like seeing this rise of that kind of culture with the biohackers? Yeah. I have to be careful on that one. Um, because you have some relationships. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck my relationships. Eat shit, Mike Bledsoe. Oh, shit. <laughs> Just kidding. Calling That's you your out, boy, Mikey. man. He's a dear friend. Oh, um, man. Um, we all love him. No, no. He's he's great. Um, just because like that word means different things to different people. Sure. So I want to make sure we're at least having the same conversation. Mm-hmm. You think I'm bitching about something else and I'm not. Like I think what those folks do is important because – that's how we make progress. That's how we learn more. Mm. That is mm-hmm. incredibly important. Someone has to be the guinea pig. Yeah. Like, and we have <laughs> sure. learned a lot of things about uh, supplements or foods or habits that we would have never gotten if people weren't trying to hack shit. Mm-hmm. So I think it is generally a good practice. But I do think that um, people misapply how important that stuff is when it's the dime before the dollar. That, that's when I have a problem with. So it's like if you're so worried about hacking your nootropic and getting your Four Sigmatic ready and you know yeah. free plug and – and all this stuff, right? But it's like you haven't eaten a vegetable in three days, right? Or you yeah. didn't like, sleep. You haven't slept <laughs> like the last two days. Yeah, exactly. Stressed out of your mind because it's so work. The, the major movers. Th- that's really what the book is about: is saying like, let's just put the stuff in the right place mm-hmm. and make sure it's way down there. If everything else, and like one of the concepts I'd bring up in there is understanding the difference between adapting and peaking, right? So if you're peaking all the time, you're not adapting. Hmm. If you're constantly optimizing your sleep, you're constantly optimizing your nootropic, you're constantly optimizing your coffee, this and all brilliant. this is optimized, yeah, this is brilliant. you're never fucking adapting. No. And because you what does that adaptation do require? That. You have to be overloaded. Stress, you have yeah. to be stressed. You have mm-hmm. to be in a suboptimal position. So like one of the things I talk about is, okay, let's say you have two important business meetings. And one of the days you sleep 12 hours, you do all your de-stress, you do your transcendental meditation, and you do your cold shower, and you get your anal coffee probe or whatever Bledsoe's doing. <laughs> That's a true story. I haven't man. tried that one yet. Oh, he has. <laughs> yes. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I believe that. Oh, man. I would have asked him that. I oh, turned water into coffee bad. through my ass. <laughs> yeah, you can ask him about that. His wife, Ashley, did it too. No way. Oh, wow. I've actually had she several him with it, I've right? had several people DM me and be like, hey, what do you think about this? Like, does exactly. it help? Like, what's the science plan? I'm like, fuck. Yeah. Okay. I take coffee the other way. Yeah. So, anyways, let's say you do that. Great. Right, and you have 
And that's what you need to do to be your creative day or to do your hard meeting or to make your tough decision or whatever it is that's difficult. You're like, great, that's fantastic. Well, how often are you doing that same thing when you don't get that shit? Right. Like, why can't you just show up and be like, you know what? Fuck that. Like, I'm going to show up. I'm tired, all these things, and I'm still going to perform. Like, you have to be able to get to that gear occasionally because if not, what happens eventually? Oh, the caffeine starts to not work as well. Mm -hmm. And then the TM's not enough. You got out another lane. All of a sudden, you're like, you have a two and a half hour routine every morning just to check your email. Mm. Like now you've gotten real precious. Like mm-hmm. you're a real precious soft bitch. Like <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like real yeah. fragile. In, yeah. fa- in fact, oh. what what happens is the body does start to adapt in the sense that it tries to take you down back to your Homeostasis, normal. Right? That's a really and good so, point. When I look at all the biohackers, there's not too many of them that I'm really scared of. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't fuck with Ben. I wouldn't fuck right. with Greenfield. Greenfield is I'm still yeah. not worried. He's about, the kind of guy. I'm still not worried about. He'll me. rip your eyeball out. Right. I feel like he'd be just well, he, weird. Like he's that. a good example. I was talking to him and I asked him sort of a similar question. He's like, I don't do all this shit all every day. He's like, this is my job is to look into these things. So mm. I experiment with these things. But he's like, you think I'm lighting up all this stuff all day and like taking this every day? No. Like sometimes I go out in the woods and I don't do anything mm. for four days or whatever he does. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I would, I don't know exactly his routine. He can speak for himself on that. But I would just say, like, you need to be making sure you're putting yourself through understanding, do things sometimes to optimize, but do sometimes to adapt and make sure you're running a balance there. And, and you should be able to have a productive conversation. Like one of the ones we use um, is similar, like a follow up with what Rob did with his uh, uh, Wired to Eat. Mm-hmm. And it's like, OK, you use that to measure. You figure out which uh, foods you respond glucose best to. OK, whatever. Well, if you're having an afternoon meeting and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just in a shitty attitude because like my blood sugar's low. Like, go fuck yourself. Fix it then. <laughs> <laughs> like, you're gonna let that little marker run your whole life. Right, right. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, I slept for four hours last night. I'm just, I'm having a bad, d-. no, no, yeah. you aren't. Like, get over it. Right. Yeah. Now I fix it later. And overcome through. and adapt. Yeah. Well, yeah, let- like, let's not be so reliant on our own physiology. Like, the hunger one is what kills me. Mm. Like, I, I, my body works yeah. best when I eat a f- really frequently. All right. My mm. wife is actually the opposite. And we've done a lot of testing on this. I've worked really well on a bunch of really small meals all day. But sometimes I don't do that for that exact reason. Like we're going to go the opposite direction. And those days when I go into class and I've got meetings all day and all this crap going on and I'm on a fast, I, st- I don't give myself the excuse to go, well, you know what, Andy? Like d- just don't worry about getting that today because you're fasting today. <laughs> like, no, like I'm, expe- I'm expecting myself to do the exact same quality stuff, not have to go back and redo my work, have a great class, be super energetic and positive and give my students what they deserve in the classroom and not have a bad performance because my blood sugar is low because I haven't eaten in six hours. Mm-hmm. Well, well, I think people forget why what why adaptation happens in the first place. Like, why is your body, you know, building muscle, burning body fat, you know, getting smarter, whatever? Why is it adapting? It is responding to a stress. A stress, right? And if you take all that stress out, that's right. You your body will not uh, progress at all. And I, I love giving this example. I tell people, look. Um, Lay in, you know, work out as hard as you possibly can today and then lay in bed for a week. Now you've rested and recovered and had no yeah. stress on your muscle, given all the time to build that they could possibly have. And you know what will happen, happen when you come back to your workout? You're going to be weaker. You're not going to be as strong because you, sta- you stayed in bed. Sore. Yeah. More sore because you stayed in bed yeah. <clears throat> the entire week. Mm. From an evolutionary standpoint, I mean, this is just how our bodies evolved. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the untouchables in the fitness and health space, the the things that nobody says you should ever stress or mess with. For example, water intake. Oh, Let's yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. that for a second because yeah. that's a good one. I never hear anybody, no fitness coach or anybody who says, hey, every once in a while, don't drink as much water or don't drink water today and see what happens. Everybody's like, drink all this water all the time. Let's talk yeah. about that for a second. So it's just, it, it would be the same thing. I think you can apply this, well, in the book, obviously we do. We apply it to cold. We apply it to hot. Uh, we apply it to sleep thirst, hunger, any stress that you can go through, focus. I think you should have days where you work 16 hours a day, like get after it and then have days off, right? We acknowledge it in all these other realms, right? But we don't acknowledge it in sleep. Like, why isn't it good sometimes to do some sleep deprivation? Why not? Like having a hard time, I can't get to sleep. Really? Well, let's sleep for two hours, three nights in a row and then tell me on that fourth day if you have a hard time going to bed. Mm. Like you're gone, right? You're going to sleep. Well, it's probably, you can pick evolution, you can pick whatever you want, but these are all actually very natural stimuli. And we don't have any real science behind small bouts of dehydration. But we didn't have any any science behind small bouts of cold exposure until 10 years ago either. Mm-hmm. So we don't have a much of that. But to me, like it makes extremely logical sense and we don't have it with the sleep either, other than uh, the, the BDNFs. But it's like, 
it has to make a ton of sense. And I, I don't know how often or how much you should do it. I can I gave you like very loose recommendations in the book, but if it's been 10 that's, years since you've ever gotten thirsty, like really thirsty, <laughs> that's probably a problem. If you've never gotten cold in the last 12, if you haven't ever been hungry, and I don't, don't mean like grumbly, like my stomach, like my blood blood sugar bad, like I mean really hungry. Nobody knows what hunger feels like. Everybody's, yeah, like, nobody's gone without food for longer than 24 hours. Right. I like, mean, most people. Right. So th- these are ways that you actually find a lot of connection back with your body and understanding what does it really mean to be thirsty? And it's probably good to be super hydrated a lot. That's peaking though, right? That's optimized. Mm. But then it's also probably good to be a little bit dehydrated occasionally where we get into problems. And this is a sleep is a very good example of this is when we are, our hard days are not hard enough and our easy days are not easy enough. And so we end up with this low level underslept for a long time. And we're slightly, slightly dehydrated for long periods of time. And that, I think, is when we have problems. We don't do well enough getting hydrated when we're trying to be hydrated, but we also don't match that with little short bouts of dehydration. And we end up being like slightly underslept, slightly overfed, slightly underwatered, and it turns out that's not good. Do you feel do you feel most people I say this a lot in the show are doing uh, doing the opposite of what they really need most for their body? For example, I have found in all, all the clients that I've trained Typically, the type A high stress level clients also gravitate towards the, you know, stimulants, the high energy, you know, intensity driven type workouts. And then my yogi, crunchy, hippie, stress free people that do yoga, meditate, never see a PR or ever push their right. body. Don't you no feel, overload for sure? Right. It seems like it's the all everyone who's doing what they're doing. You need the other op- the opposite. Yeah, my friend. Uh, like I won't tell too much of this story, but my friend, you guys know Brett Contreras. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he went. He's like my fun, like one of my most favorite guys ever to troll. By the way, <laughs> like he's so easy to get him all riled up. <laughs> our, bu- our, <laughs> our buddy Jordan Jordan Shallow just riled him up uh, two days ago. Yeah, like he's. You know, I, I love Brace great. Um, just if you're just walking by him, just you know, like I don't know if the glutes are really so important, bro. Like, <laughs> like I just step back, <laughs> just just drop that and great. run. Yeah, but there's he got all riled up on the internet. Um, I don't remember what medium it was on about something and somebody else like talking back and forth. But his basic point was like, yeah, you guys are never hurt in your program because you never have any overload. When's the last time you got stronger? Like you've never added muscle mass. You've never lost weight. Yeah, like your shoulder mobility is great now. And for nine years, you've done nothing but improve your shoulder mobility and you're fat and soft and have no muscle. And your heart rate's never been above like 120, right. except for when you do hot yoga. Like, <laughs> so I'm with you too. Like yeah. the, we've got to make sure we're playing on all sides here, especially if we're talking about longevity or well-roundedness or overall health. Um, yeah, you, you don't want to be just in one end of the spectrum. We're, we're being as amateur about that as as we have thinking that one of these things is going to take care of all of our. Problems. What do you What do you think it is that that drives us like that? What makes us want to be in boxes and stick to one idea? Tribe, man, it's your tribe. Yeah, that's how we survived. Yeah, you know, we found people that we could stick to, and then you know, I, I mean, the number one killer. I mean, one of the worst, uh, or probably uh, worst things you could ever do if you lived in the wilderness with your hunter gatherer friends or whatever was be isolated yeah. you're for sure going to die if you don't have your tribe so it's, it's it's just natural in fact if you look at um when people list their top fears you know the top 10 fears that could happen you know in, in life one of the top ones is public speaking and it's only because of the fear of making a fool of yourself in front of your tribe and having people shun you or whatever and being yeah. isolated so that's it's just a natural tendency but i do <laughs> think What we're seeing with the connection of people worldwide is our tribes are starting to get larger and larger. Whereas your tribe, well, they're being defined by different things now. Yeah, Mm. that's the big thing. It's no longer defined by like who lives and works in my gym, because now I can have a different tribe of of liberals or whatever this they Mm -hmm. can be, and they can be completely. Geography is no longer the limitation behind Mm -hmm. tribalism, um, and it's expanding. But I think a a part of it also is what we talked about at the beginning today is. It's, it's confusing, right? And there's all this shit. And now I'm confused. Like, wait, is yoga good for me? Is it bad for me? And then is this, you know what? Like, I found one thing. I'm not getting hurt. I like it. I'm just going to stick to that. And I think that's uh, one of the reasons. And then, of course, you develop buy-in and you develop community in that. And then you want to defend that. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and we're, I think one of the real difficult parts of the internet that people have is people are not very good about separating discussion information from wanting more benefit or success of the thing itself than the actual merit Mm. and that's sort of like i want to defend mind pump media that's what i want to do because i love them and i got their shirts and everything and regardless of what they do i want to defend them and i'm more vested in their success than what they're actually saying Mm. and that's great for you as a company 
right? But it actually, it makes discussion really difficult because then when you do fuck up or you say something wrong, like they're defending you no matter what you do. And then now I long, I, I can't trust their, their, their decisions mm-hmm. anymore because I'm like, you're not really worried about that. You just want to defend them at all costs. And th- that is a problem. And that's where we have so many of these fights back and forth because most of those fights don't matter. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. You yeah. know, the irony of that is we encourage, constantly encourage our audience to question us and, you know, if we're going to say something that you feel you have a different opinion or if there's evidence to suggest the yeah. opposite, only because we know the long-term strategy uh, is better that way. Sure. I think if you if you build this false whatever around your, you know, this fake tribe or whatever, you're right. Yeah. The second we really do fuck up, which is going to happen, everybody does, yeah. we're done. Well, yeah, we're, if you build a fake facade of infallibility... One crack, the whole thing's gone. That's right. But if you got holes all the time everywhere, it's like, oh, that's going to hold. Yeah, again. trust me. We talk about how it, it, uh, hel- it helps that the, the three shooter. of us disagree on a lot <laughs> and argue openly on the show. I think that that is what cover- it moves over into the forum and all of our other platforms. So I think that's part of the deal, too. So people feel comfortable with if we challenge each other all the time mm-hmm. on the show, they feel comfortable to do the same thing. And I think that's probably the, the problem with a lot of podcast shows or anything that we listen to that have, you know, one, two or three or more guys that are connected is they all agree on all topics where yeah. uh, that's part of the magic here is that we're, we're three different guys mm-hmm. that train differently, eat differently and openly discuss it. And everybody has an intelligent point of view. I agree. And we encourage that well, um, with our audience. So. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. I agree. Uh, uh, anything in the current, in the, your current space that is really exciting. You had brought up a, a, a I don't know if I can mention a study you're going to do on creatine. Or anything now that's getting you real excited? Well, you know, we have a bunch of projects going up. Um, for those of you listening, uh, about a foot and a half to my left is is my friend Jimmy Bagley, and he's got a, a muscle physiology lab up here at San Francisco State. Which we're gonna started. we got to come play play pay a yeah. visit for sure. Yeah, we, we definitely we'll, do. We'll I want to check that out, here. dude. He just built so he, oh man, he's got a bunch of these uh, one laser scanning confocal microscope, and he's got these other real cool. And then you just built a, how big is your new gym? Two thousand square feet, all rigs, lifting platforms, all this shit, like in his university. Hell yeah! So they just opened it what, yesterday. Mm-hmm. Like we just walked in there, so it's really badass. I'm like, you walk <laughs> down the hall, and he's got barbells, squat racks, um, hex bars, you know, all this stuff. And then down the hall is this laser scanning confocal microscope where we're imaging muscle fibers at the single cell level. And you're like, that's like, that's whoa, what's that's up. a contrast. Holy yeah. shit, yeah. That's awesome. So it's really cool. So you guys can go up there and do a day up there with him sometime. Um, but we, we have a lot of projects that we're working on together. Mm-hmm. Which are really cool. Um, we just submitted yesterday a, a paper from Irene Tobias, my postdoc, um, where we actually were pretty confident now we're finding a difference in post-exercise anabolic window between the fiber types. Hmm. So there's a different window. Um, the length at which the, the window is, is extended is, is specific to the fiber type. Interesting. Really cool. What are yeah. you seeing? What do you are you notice? Is it consistent? Like guys with more slow twitch tend to respond this way, more fast twitch. So the preliminary data right now suggests the slow twitch fibers have a, a the more traditional thirty to sixty minute post exercise window, but the fast twitch are up like two two and a half three hours. Wow. So well, that that just that'll that'll kill the post workouts. You know, supplement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to build well, that, muscle. That's mostly been Slam killed anyways. Yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. Slam it right after. Um, yeah. That's true. Yeah, we kind of poo poo on that already because as it's splitting hairs, the difference in comparison. What are you noticing between the two different fibers? Is it is it is it that drastic of a difference? It is. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's it's massively different. But here's the key: like this is another example of of it's, it, you always have to use context, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So, for example, do any of you three guys work out in the morning fasted? I do. Yeah. Okay, great. So for you, it might be really important then, especially mm-hmm. if if you're a a slow twitch kind of guy. You work out in the morning and you're fasted. And if you're trying to optimize muscle growth, then maybe it's super important to get that meal in really quickly. Mm-hmm. But the rest of you guys work out in the afternoon. Right. You're, then it probably doesn't matter. And we've already fed, got yeah. food in And yeah. you're fed and all these things, right? So even with signs like that, like you still have to take it and put it under context. Well, how are you applying it? What are your life situations? Even if we took you against Alan and we changed the goal. I was just going to say, if his goal that, was to lean out, you actually would probably be better off not having it. Or maybe you go through periods where you're trying to optimize, right? Maximizing muscle growth. But then you go through a period where you're like, let's teach the body to become more resilient. And then we won't give it all the things it needs. And it has to figure out ways. And, and that's kind of like a janky way of, of saying what happens. I kind of skipped the science there, but you get the basic idea, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. so we, we have to be careful with any of the science that we do or anybody else. It's like, it doesn't mean blanket prescription. Mm. It just means, okay, this is information, but now you still have to think through of how you're applying it in the situation. What's the goal of today, this week, this month? What's the client's goal? 
What stage are we in? What are we trying to do here? And that determines how we apply these things. So giving blanket prescriptions like that are a really terrible idea. Context is yeah. so important. Dude, you yeah. have to. Do you just ignore questions when, when people ask a question? Like yeah, that because, way too long to answer. Because there's no, it, yeah. there's no way, there is no like exact answer. Did, well, you, did you see my Rogan episode? Yeah, I know. <laughs> that, was, like, that was that for Every question hours. was like yeah. that. I, know. I, was like, I don't know. It depends, man. Like, what are you doing <laughs> with it? Like, what's the goal? Well, Consider all the variables. That's yeah. what yeah. we sound like when clients yeah. ask us, yeah. you know, yeah. certain questions. The same thing. Depends is always the first answer. It's funny because you, we notice these things with exercise. It's pretty easy. Like, you know, what rep range builds the most muscle? Well, what rep range are you in now? Because when we change it, you're going to get a new, yeah, yeah. you know, you're yeah. going to get some a new, new stimulus, growth. Yeah. But if you were to compare head to head, you got the eight to 12 and all that stuff. But we don't apply that to anything else. It's as if yeah. nutrition doesn't apply. Like, no, I'm going to yeah. keep my protein 175 grams every single day, or I'm going to eat exactly, you know, 10 minutes yeah. after my workout every single di- time. Yeah. And what ends up happening is your body becomes less efficient. There's actually evidence to show with protein, for example, that eating high protein all the time, super frequently reduces your body's efficiency with it. You actually become yeah. less sensitive to protein. And we know this with hormones as well. If they're elevated too long, your body down regulates receptors and does all this other stuff. So it's a great idea. I recommend people have like low protein days. I recommend people yeah. fast after the workout sometimes because I know when you then go back and eat post-workout or when you go, you do go back and you have high protein, all of a sudden you get this. Yeah, and there's easy, anabolic game there's easy ways to implement this stuff where like, you know, if I'm working with an athlete and they have multiple practices or something, well, now I'm going to have a completely different approach because they need, and they're, they're six weeks out from a fight or something. Well, we need to maximize recovery. We are eating the second they get off. They're, I'm trying to get them to consume stuff during workouts, sure. things like that, right? Well, that's different than saying like, I'm going to work out really hard on a Friday, but then I'm going to Napa Valley for the weekend. And like, I'm not going to work out again until Wednesday. Well, like you're going to be fully recovered by that Wednesday. You don't need to maximize the signal right then. So it all depends on the context. And we are, by the way, going tomorrow to Napa. So. Oh, all right. <laughs> so I brought that up. I'm on sabbatical, guys. I'm not work too hard. That I want to. I want to so. take Andy to the conversation that we had back in Austin that uh, you know mysteriously disappeared. I want, <laughs> never made the light of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it never went up. Yeah, what's right? up with that? No, it yeah. didn't. Uh, they, uh, they lost the file. Your boys there. over on your side over there lost the audio supposedly. So. <laughs> And oh, you guys let them in charge of it? I know, oh, man. right? Never again. That we handled the, okay. this. We handled this one. Go yeah. Doug. Yeah, yeah. yeah Doug. <laughs> right. No, he's Where you at, bro? Mike, too much Apparently nootropics more responsible. and uh, supplementation over there. Uh, yeah. yeah. But that was an incredible conversation. It's by the not, way, that would not be the first time some shit like that's happened. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, just Uh-oh. bus chucking now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck Barbara. But Trump. that was oh such a oh, man. That was such a great conversation. It's not that often. I feel like we bring somebody on the show and they just completely blow our mind on a topic that I feel that most of us are pretty well versed in and it was on the, it was the history of bodybuilding right was oh, yeah. It, yeah is that what yeah. we got into yeah we were talking about just uh, how it became popular to use body part split routines mm-hmm. versus ah, the traditional right. full body ah, routine. Yeah. you know what's funny about this shit is that it's all starting to make full circle again I fucking love it yeah yeah all of a sudden I see all these people being like oh dude if you train your muscles uh, you know use the same volume but train them like three days a week instead of one day a week with this, all that volume one day you build more muscle. And we got studies supporting it. And I'm like, dude, that's how people lifted yeah. before steroids. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 yeah that's funny. I mean, that's why we took uh, all that time to, to trace that uh, episode. It was really actually pretty cool because um, let's see, when did we, when were we in Austin? In May? I think something like yeah, April, May, June, May. Yeah, yeah. something. Well, like two months after that, I was at the NSCA and I was I was getting my fellowship award and like the people that get awards sit at the same table and I was sitting next to this old dude. And like no one was talking to him. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? And what, what award? I'm like, if I'm at the NSC, I know who you are. I'm like, I don't know who this guy is. And there's this lady sitting next to him, and they're like old. And, I, and they started talking, and I was like, wait a minute. And they told me their last names. And they're like Jan and Terry Todd. And I was like, holy fuck! Like you guys have done all the sports history of all bodybuilding history, weightlifting, like all the shit I talked about in that episode. All the thing I told you about was all from their work that I was reading. Oh no way! And I was like, oh my god! Like I was like straight fanboy, like fumbling my phone. I was like, can I take? And like no one else knows who these people are. <laughs> like, like they don't have. But Jan, uh, I still. She was telling me she's like probably 65 or something, and she's still deadlifting 400 for triples. What? Like, like just wow. savage. Wow. What? Dude, yeah. she out deadlifts Amazing. you, Justin, and she's 65, oh, man. Oh, oh, oh man. Uh, but she, she held a bunch of world records in powerlifting Maybe back now. in the day. And <laughs> oh. he did too. Um, so they're sport historians. Like, they trace this whole thing. And their story, the conversion of Dr. Karpovich, is where we got. Most of it, and they had a bunch of other follow-ups. So I did, I got a bunch of gold from them too. 
they have a really cool facility in Austin. Uh, next time you guys, if you guys go back to Paleo, you guys got to go to their lab. They have a huge history of bodybuilding like facility. Oh, cool. The history of weightlifting. Where? Class. This is in t- at UT. Dude, University how do we miss this? Oh, we're going. Yeah, we yeah. have to go. We're going. I can connect you guys. Oh, we're going. That'd be great. Yeah, this was a, for a long time. This was like a passion of mine. I'd read all the stuff and then yeah. kind of figure out like the origins of, you know, all these. If we talked about uh, the studies by uh, Dr. Arthur Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, yeah. The, the, the Nautilus. Nautilus. Yeah. The Nautilus studies. And oh, I, that's right. How did machines even come about and how yeah, that yeah, all yeah. happened? So, in addition to that, uh, literally yesterday, the guy from Men's Health that was up here is Lou Schuler. Mm. I don't know if you guys, lo- but he used to work for the Weeders. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Like he used to work from the back day. So I, I dug a bunch of gold out of him. Oh too. really? How yeah. Cool. Yeah. So like just a, it's it's an incredible story though. Uh, if you understand, like we did it because part of what we we're talking about earlier, like one of the things that motivates me through this field is helping people. Like there's nerds like us that want to dedicate our lives to, like diving into this shit, right? Mm. And I have fun. Like I love the confusion part of it, you know, personally. But I understand how that's extremely frustrating and unhelpful for other people. Right. And so I'm like, I think if you can just trace the history of why things are the way they are, it can relieve a lot of pressure from the other day person. And they can go like, oh, okay, maybe that shit doesn't matter. This is all I have to do. Mm-hmm. So we traced and went back and this kind of helped people understand why the nutrition field evolved, why the supplement industry evolved, and why the, the exercise. And I, I love the way Thomas Kuhn puts it out, who's a... I think he was a German philosopher, but he says there's synthesis, right? Or, or there's uh, hypothesis, right? Thesis. And then that swings all the way to the end of the pendulum, which is antithesis. And then it actually lands almost always back in the middle, which is synthesis. And just a quick version of our of our uh, story, because it took me like a 17 hours of audio to get this whole story down. So I'll give you the condensed version. But basically what happens is the field moves along, and this is can be traced through any field, economics, anything, right? Kuhn was pretty solid with that idea. And let's just jump to Arthur Jones, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like Nautilus. Okay, great. That's fantastic. And this is how we optimize muscle growth, right? And it's pretty damn good, right? You hop on a, you train like that. And, and then, you know, Menser came along and did his high intensity stuff and that's fine. And it was all machine based for the most part. And it was our classic uh, muscle split, you know, like delts and backs and buys. Okay, great. And that was fantastic. And people were really happy because people gained a lot of muscle mass and you started looking like superheroes, right? And this is prior to the Instagram and Photoshop. And like, you actually physically had to look good. Right? And it's like, God, you look like a fucking superhero. And prior to human, like any time in human existence, you couldn't physically look like that. And so we're literally seeing people, I mean, like our generation, like look at the bodybuilders that we right. grew up looking at. And we're like, holy shit. Yeah. Like these are fucking Monsters. cartoon characters. Yeah. And people got that from these damn machines. And you can get that, right? Uh, and, and so that was a huge thing and then but that left a space for well maybe this isn't great for cardiovascular health or maybe this isn't great for whatever other mark performance right you're not super powerful this way maybe you're not or long term or whatever whatever it is right and so enter this big hole so there was their first thesis swing to the other end of the pendulum which is antithesis was like okay now enter crossfit and CrossFit's whole thing was like, first of all, you're not going to be here for three and a half hours like a bodybuilding workout takes you because you have to do 12 sets of every body part six different ways, right? And we're going to get you in and out 20 minutes. we get your heart rate super high. You're going to lose a ton of weight and health markers are going to go way up. And that's way more quote unquote functional. And that took off and people started seeing results and everyone's like, wow, I can get in and out of the gym in 20 minutes and I'm doing big movements and, and this is great. And so they swung back then and said, okay, that's fantastic. But before they landed on synthesis, they actually went back the other direction, which is now CrossFit is the only thing. Therefore, everything from bodybuilding must be terrible. Mm. And that was the problem. It's like, well, no, 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 hold on here. But if you look at the CrossFit culture, and I think we're coming out of that right now Mm -hmm. from that culture of going like, well, wait a minute, my shoulder fucking hurts and my Mm -hmm. knee's killing me. And like, I constantly have the same problem every time I do this workout. Why? Because I refuse to do any bicep curls. Why? Because they're not functional. But why can I never do the pull-up routine? (laughs) <laughs> like why does my elbow blow up every time I do this one because mm-hmm. you ever you ever thought about doing some bicep curls no fucking way bro not no functional way. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah cause you, the bros. because yeah. you have a muscle Blasphemy. that's somehow not functional <laughs> by the way yeah like again and now you see them integrating that it's like well as a finisher uh, you know I'll do the, this pump routine or whatever and as a finisher I'll get my tries and I'll pump them out and you're like bro now, now we're back to 1980 yeah. uh, like we're right fucking back to 1980 <laughs> yeah and, and, and then you see that swing. And so now we've landed on synthesis, which is to say, oh, okay. Maybe just running five miles a day is not 
the only thing that's good for me. And maybe just doing an hour and a half of each body part isolated on a machine is not the best thing ever. And then maybe doing fucking pull-ups and squat every day. That's my only thing, but it's so varied. And it's the same three exercises every damn time. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's not the whole thing either. And, and we land, and so we swing back and forth, and it's a piston match and dick swinging contest, and eventually we just end up in the middle a little bit, which is a synthesis saying, this is the good part about this and the good part about that, and this is maybe the whole of this and this is the whole of this approach, and now we can actually just take and implement the pieces that we need depending on the situation and circumstance. Bro, that's l- yeah, that's, that's what mind we, pump. That's exactly yeah. what we try to do. We really, yeah. really try as hard as we can to do that for people to help them with that process because that pendulum... It swings back and forth, and it keeps swinging back and forth. And I'm going to give credit to the CrossFit world. No, it's fantastic. No, let me tell you why I want to give them credit, because you're right. They were ridiculous. In fact, some of our first episodes were literally titled Why Mind Pump Doesn't CrossFit, because of that, what you're talking about. But to the the credit of the CrossFit uh, uh, community... They seem to uh, the, everything can get dogmatic. They, but they seem to want. They reintroduce some of the most important movements Dude, that we real. had neglected for fucking twenty. But they, years. they but saved fucking weightlifting yeah. for sure. Like not even close. Like, sure. like this is. For I have sure. ninety for one bad thing I say about CrossFit. I got ninety nine good things. Yes, like right. easy. But it's not. But it's not even that. What I'm saying is the CrossFit community seems to always want to just improve and do what's better. So they seem open. They, they, they've evolved very quickly. Bodybuilders have not. Yeah. They, they take a long fucking time to evolve. They're very hard-headed. The CrossFit world tends to, it looks like they tend, because now I see them talking about eating, you know, certain starchy carbohydrates, improve mm-hmm. performance. Well, five Movement years ago, yeah, 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 five yeah, years yeah, ago, yeah. it was fucking paleo, like yeah, hardcore, no and, right, you yeah, know, yeah. but now they're talking about, oh, buckweed, and if you eat this one and eat that, you know, starchy right, carb, right. it can help, and you're, they're implementing different exercises, and I'm seeing programming now where they're doing less of the going to crazy fatigue with the complex right. Olympic lifts that calls all the injury type of stuff. Yeah. So I just want to give them that credit because I like seeing that. No, I, I would say like and I'm on record years ago on radio and everything saying this about CrossFit because I, I actually was one of the first scientific defenders of CrossFit because mm-hmm. uh, I'm like, you guys, you can't, can't blame CrossFit for all the all these problems. First of all, they're ran independently. Like the coaching is just as bad or good depending on the person. Sure. It has nothing to do with the name of CrossFit, et cetera. And they did. They saved my sport. Like they saved weightlifting. They they did a lot for powerlifting. They got people doing big exercises. They got women squatting and deadlifting. They got, yeah, like yeah. this is a fucking great thing. They got cl- power cleans in, a, in the vernacular. Like this is in yeah. the lexicon now. Right. Like this is this is good uh, for the vast majority. Um, and then if we like, in fact, like most of what we do with body knowledge, my co-host Kenny Kane, like he was one of the first guys I came across that was like he built this thing called Context. And he has this unbelievably unique, uh, in fact, that's the Mastery Method shirt I'm wearing, like this super innovative programming style that's it's like, he, is, he runs CrossFit LA, which is the seventh or eighth ever CrossFit gym. Mm. But he does this really innovative programming where it's effectively like, you know, if you have a month programmed out, 60% of the days are built for practice, mm. 30% or whatever are built for competition, and then 10% are mental toughness. And so he's had this model for years now, and he hit like nobody gets hurt in his gym. Oh wow, that's great, man! And that's like so he programs backwards things like that, and people have stole that left and right and like gone on with it. And I'm like, but no, you're right. Like this is you're seeing an evolution. And the one thing, I, the first thing I said positive about CrossFit when it came up was I've never seen a field that is more concerned with everything else in the life. Yep. Very they are true. excellent at that. Like, well, let's build a healthy lifestyle. So let's talk yeah. about your sleep. Let's talk about your hydration. Let's start eating better That's food. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, no other community has done that. I'll tell you what, dude, because of our message, because we hammer all that stuff and about the, the, the whole athlete and looking yeah. at all these different things. It's funny because we're always blown away by how large our CrossFit audience is, even though our early episodes, we hammered them so hard, so, yeah, yeah, so yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. And it's because of that. It's because they're always yeah. looking. And I really like that about, about that community. Well, and, a lot of people, a lot of people, I mean, it's funny that people, unless you, if you're an outsider, right, you don't listen to Mind Pump. Some people thought that about us. But I mean, we talk probably more shit about bodybuilding. Than else. And I'm oh, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm an IFBB pro. So it yeah. not, not, has nothing to do with, with that. It's like exactly what we're talking about right now. It's just challenging everything. It's yeah. helping people understand to take the good of everything, everything that we've been doing since back then. Yeah. There's something good to take from all of it and apply to your own and, life and, and, and to not become dogmatic about yeah. any of it. I mean, you'll hear me shit on science more than anybody. That's <laughs> <laughs> like what I do. Right? Yeah. You're like, hey, take that science, throw it away, listen to your body. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, right? I, like, come on. I just, I think with bodybuilding in that particular sense, bodybuilding's just, it was most of the information that was promoted through bodybuilding when it kind of became a thing was through the lens of 
selling supplements. It was these oh, magazines yeah. that yeah. were, you know, these these muscle and fitness, or as as we call it, muscle and fiction, flex, you know, whatever, yeah. Muscle Media two thousand and Iron Man, which were basically designed to sell you both the sport of bodybuilding and uh, supplements. They were not designed to inform you. They were never that. with a big pamphlet. Sure. And so a lot of the information we've gotten from them was through that lens, which is why it, say, it stayed so stagnant for so long. And then the other piece of it is when anabolic steroids came into the, into the, uh, into the field, you're talking about entirely new science. And these athletes stopped progressing on their training because they were progressing with their drugs. Yeah, they got really yeah. fucking smart. And I'll tell you something right now. If you want to talk to any athlete in the world about how to maximize and stack and take which drugs when and whatever to maximize you know, muscle adaptation and growth, nobody comes close to a bodybuilder. Body, I know bodybuilders yeah. who know more about hormones than, uh, more than I do. Than scientists yeah, in, you know, sure. in the field of hormones. Yeah. You know? In fact, I had a, uh, I had a client uh, once who was an um, endo... endo Endocrinologist, am I saying endocrinologist? That right? Yeah, see, I say it right. Doug makes fun of me sometimes. <laughs> and uh, he, I was talking to him, and I, you. I know a lot about uh, the drugs that bodybuilders use because I was a big, I was just passionate about it, and so I'm just, I tend to obsess mm. over shit. And so I'm talking about how bodybuilders use testosterone and you know selective estrogen receptor modulators and how they yeah. use you know you know uh, growth hormones and peptides and insulin and, and what HCG they do. And, yeah. and he's looking at me like, holy shit, man! He's like, how do you know about all this stuff? I'm like, oh, it's just fucking. It's that's that's all their science went into that teenage part of bodybuilding. <laughs> Thank you. you know what I mean? <laughs> Bodybuilding.com. Thank and you. And they stopped looking at the other stuff, but I am seeing now a return to the important because bodybuilding for a long time totally ignored exercise programming. It, it, yeah, it yeah. was a thing for a second and then it became, everybody's routine looked the same. Yeah. It was just your favorite bicep exercise, for, but everybody did the same shit. Yeah. You're starting to get a return back to exercise programming, even yeah. in bodybuilding. Did you hear that amazing interview with, um, oh, who was it? Uh, oh, oh, Dorian Yates? No, I didn't listen to it. Oh my God, it's awesome. Because he basically was like, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> He's just like we just started taking drugs left and right. Like, nobody knows. It's it. true like, though. We'll yeah. figure it out. It's, yeah. it's true, and it's really hard to get through. So I remember coming up through the the bodybuilding circuit, and I've got a lot of buddies that are pros, and you know, trying to get them to uh, listen to me is just impossible. When you're trying to talk to somebody, and yeah. I, and I think the part of that problem is the the aesthetic piece, right? When they have built so much muscle and look so good in spite of what they're doing it's really tough to try and convince that guy like hey you probably don't want to do this do that because yeah. they're like fuck you look at me bro yeah you know yeah. it's like Ugh. fair enough <laughs> hey man when when I, you know when you're telling me oh you're, you're telling me that a deadlift will develop my back more than you know whatever other exercise meanwhile i can take insulin and take a bunch of carbs with it and gain you know 15 <laughs> pounds in two months like right. who gives a shit about deadlifts you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not that important so right. yeah but you know i love the I love watching the evolution of programming th from bodybuilding through the lens of the marketers behind it because I find it so fascinating. Yeah. Because you have like the weeders who really popularized body part splits. It was sure. the weeders that sure. popularized that and they made it their thing. And then they came up with these like, you know, the weeder principles. I don't even remember them all. Do you I remember have, all those? No, I, absolutely not. I have no idea. Uh, I remember them for sure. But Do you remember I, they were weeder principles? Yeah, absolutely. Like the principle yeah. of pumping and the principle yeah. of whatever. And <laughs> that was really to sell magazines. It sure. really was. And then everybody started training that way. And then Arthur Jones was, you know, we talked about him for a second. He wanted to sell Nautilus equipment. And the way he did it was he took a pro bodybuilder, Casey, uh, Casey Viter, who was uh, a massive, massive... 19 year old uh, bodybuilder who was totally deconditioned, stopped working out. And he said, Hey, come in here. <laughs> I'm going to train you on my Nautilus. Start taking some gear again. Yeah. We're going to film how much muscle you gain. And then we're going to talk about the routine. And, and he the did famous, the opposite yeah. of the weeder, which was lots of sets or whatever. And he just went, Go to failure as hard as possible, each muscle group on these machines before and after. And then you, you created a new movement based mm -hmm. behind that. None of it based on mm -hmm. actual science. Oh, there you go. There's one of his principles, the forced reps principle. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. The, uh, the pre-exhaustion principle. You know how much I learned from oh, yeah. these magazines? Muscle confusion principle. So, oh, you know when you P90X see- When that. you hear these assholes oh, talking yeah. about muscle confusion, <laughs> oh, yeah. they yeah. went back and learned from the gods of marketing and bodybuilding. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. like, again, you're not going <laughs> to find anything new in these areas. 
Yeah. Like, no way you're going to find something there. Yeah. Like, P90X just came up on some brand new way to train. Like, go fuck yourself. Oh, <laughs> like, come on now. I love yeah. hearing you say that because somebody asked me uh, asked me about Marketing Orange Theory, and yeah. they yeah. have completely built their model around the... Um, you know, orange uh, zone. Yeah, you well, they're, they're target, target heart rate. Target heart rate yeah, zone. The, yeah. The, oh yeah, like the, that's new. <laughs> fat burning <laughs> yeah, zone. Right. Yeah. Right. And because they put some colors on it, and then give you like a little graph. Fact, that that only, not only is that not new, but that's like been shown to be so wrong so many years ago. Right. Yeah. You're like oh god, like I thought we were past that. I literally stopped putting those slides in my classes because I'm like, all right, no one even no one even knows what I'm talking about. I'm breaking a myth that no one's uh, even aware of anymore, and now I got to put it back in. Dude, I, it just seems like they oh need God. a hook, so Here they go, go back That's and they find a term, and they're like, "Ah, oh, let's use that one and make a franchise." Well, like you said, out those guys it. were good at it though, man. Like uh, they spent some time there. Leader and Hoffman were no joke in those areas. No, no, they were brilliant. Uh, Mar- they created the whole industry, and then there, you have you know other people that came along. We talked yeah. in a previous episode about Bill Phillips, and sure, he he talk about a genius right he, there with he, marketing. He took supplements to an entirely new level. Yeah. And then they really broke things down. And then you had Dan Duquesne, who was, you know, I don't, do you know who Dan Duquesne was? No. He was a, so he was a good friends with Bill Phillips, one of the authors of Muscle Media 2000. And mm-hmm. he was, he wrote the, the, the steroid Bible or what was it called? Do you remember that book? The, the, the anabolic Bible. Right? Anabolic Bible. Mm-hmm. I think he was one of the authors and he was like this Solid. no holds barred, you know, kind of fitness, uh, you know, guru who would talk about all these secret ways that he was one of the first guys to talk about the fat burner and I know I'm getting it wrong. I think it's DNP, if I'm not mistaken. It's actually something that's used to make dynamite. And it's this highly poisonous thing that you take. <laughs> oh, wow. Sounds that makes real healthy. It yeah. yeah. makes is, you no, sweat your is, dick off. burn inside. Is, no, people is, are using this it. Is, no, this is actually you a big, Right now in the bodybuilding world, this is actually resurfacing right now. Yep. A lot oh, of my pro shit. buddies are fucking around with this right now. DNP? Yes. D- can you look it up, Doug? I want to make sure I have it right. D- Put N-P DNP psh, fat dynamite. burning or something like that. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's Man, what... Man, that's funny because like those are the types of questions I'll get in class from occasion and I have no idea. They're like, what, isn't that what you, this what you do? I'm like, <laughs> no. <laughs> like, no. Yeah. Like, and they're blown away you don't know what it is? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I studied uh, muscle physiology. Like, what are you talking so about? So there it is. So uh, fatal see, supplement. Again, making a scary comeback. What's, what's, the, is... what's, the, what's the name of it? If you could look up the... Because that's DNP obviously stands for... Oh, wait, there it is. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So apparently you take this and you fucking feel like you have the worst flu of your life and i'm just reading what people are writing oh it turns your temperature up to like i mean you're you're walking around like you're in a sauna all day long yeah and it's just horrible how much of that is needed and, and it'll like, come you. on it'll literally kill you because it's that it's, it's like you're cooking it. your insides to get like the slightest edge for, <laughs> for <laughs> but this is the shit that makes me react the way i react the marketing stuff and i'm like Ugh, like i want no part of this. this is not helpful well to so anybody. so here's the thing so uh we taught uh, sales training in four people in fitness for a long time. I did this for a very long time. I would teach yeah. managers and trainers and fitness managers how to, how to sell. sell DMP? No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Swing that Wait. DMP. I'm, let me tell you this. If you're going to take a drug, you lose weight. Crystal meth. <laughs> Crap <laughs> out of DMP. Stay you skinny. Your, you lose your teeth too, but that's different. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I would teach them how to sell training, memberships, whatever. And every single time when I would talk to salespeople, they'd have no problem with what I was telling them. When I'd be in trainers in the room, I'd go to other gym, yeah, other yeah, gyms. Yeah. I'd take trainers in there and they'd be like, okay, we're here for our training. I'm like, cool, I'm going to teach you guys how to sell training. Everybody was like, eh, I'm, oh, not yeah, a, yeah. I'm not a salesman. I'm a trainer. I don't want to say. And it's like, listen. No, you aren't. <laughs> well, You're a salesman. Well, well, listen, here's the thing. And, and same thing for you. Like, you have this bad taste. Sales really is nothing more than effective communication. Sure. Now, your experience with a lot of sales is what a lot of our experience is with sales is there's a lot of bullshit out there. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's about being able to communicate effectively, and the, the one of the the only ways that I can think of to beat the bad information is to sell the good information right. better. And so, as much as we get turned off by it, we got to get good at it. Otherwise, we're going to lose. Yeah. You know, we're going to lose the battle. Well, this is the only reason I have social media. Is that this exact conversation played back three years ago or something with Doug and Mike, and they had to explain to me, walk to me, like why, and I was like, okay, actually, I see the point now, and that's why I do it. And it's still like Jimmy and I get a lot of. Of, of shit either in front of our face or behind it because of how active we are and then mm-hmm. how much stuff we take to put on there but that was the basic point a study came out a handful of years ago that said like I think it was on average seven people like I think on average seven people read a scientific study so you're like okay how, how much impact are you really making that when you just post studies 
No, just like like period. If you do a study, like oh. seven people will read it. Oh, what? on average, you if you serious? looked at all the studies that are out there, on average, that seven, study right? gets read by like seven people. Wow, wow, all the way through. Yeah. Wow. So you're like, okay, that's deflating. How much of an impact yeah. you're really making? That's right? got to kind of sting a little bit, you, you, right? So then it's like, okay, well, here's your option. Then you need to be able to take the the responsibility and the leadership to go. You know what? I'm going to take that science put it in a way that is understandable and implementable, actionable for everyday people. Mm. I will take that extra time because it is a huge time drain and put it out there. And then actually you start get some interaction and people start to get, so the real information does get through, but the scientists in our case need to take the time, the responsibility to go that extra step to do that, or else you're just going to continue to get drowned out in nonsense. And, and if we aren't doing that, like who's going to? Now, there are studies that a lot of people will refer to and know about, <laughs> but this is because yeah. the supplement makers and marketers grab on to one them. piece of yeah. a study yeah. that sounds cool, and they're like, fuck, we could sell this. Dude, and the, then they do a great job of getting it out there. Everybody's like, hey, what about that study that showed that if I eat you know, tilapia, that I get this increase in proteins or whatever, you know, I'm making yeah. shit up, but you get, my, you get the drift. Yeah, yeah, I, like- so such a high percentage of the times I've been in the media, I've been misquoted. Like it's, it's just ridiculous. I have like I'm very stringent upon that stuff now. I'm like I need to see the final version hmm. before you're getting a clear now. Because so many times, especially with our papers, uh, like we did a study where we looked. We we're the first people to do uh, look at d- banded deadlifts, right? Hmm. So you're doing heavy with heavy banded deadlifts versus regular, and it came out uh, if, if I'm remembering it right. I think the the bands were better for uh, power and velocity, but the non banded was better for force production. And then the title was something like, you know, bands don't work. And I was like, what in the, what hell? the hell? Like, this is not even remotely close to what we found. Or like, it was some other nonsense. And there was several of them that kept popping up. And eventually I just like stopped chasing them down. But I was like, this is not even remotely close to what we found. And we, I even did like a little email exchange with them. And they're like, oh, and, then, and then the thing that came out, I'm like, that's not what I said. That's not what I wrote. Like, you're taking this completely out of context. It's, it's really, really hard to do that. And I stopped doing it. Eventually people always ask me like, do you chase these things down? I'm like, no, cause there's so many hundreds of them out there now. I'm like, that would be my whole day. Like I would wow. just be running around trying to fix all these misquotes and, and bands. And so, I uh, mean, Jimmy had a paper that just took off really big. Um, he just came out with the first room. You mean more than seven people read it? Yeah, seven, <laughs> seven, seven, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's not bad. He was the first, he did a review article on, um, concurrent training. So you guys probably saw this paper actually, or at least heard of it, but he was the first review paper that came out and said, actually, you know, we have this idea that aerobic exercise actually blocks all of your hypertrophy, like your potential gains. Mm-hmm. And he actually was the first one that came out and was like, actually, like the data doesn't show that at all. Uh, so there's some context there. And that took off in people because they're like, aha, like concurrent training or doing both actually maybe doesn't block all of your gains. Uh, so that one took off for him pretty well, but the rest of our shit, nobody reads. Excellent. I want to hear more yeah, about that. I was going to say, how did you set know, that up? Yeah, explain, I want to hear more explain, about that. Explain the... Um, That's or, a Jimmy paper. You're going to have to... Get okay. in front of this mic to walk or we'll, that. Or we'll give us, get the information, we'll read it up. Yeah, because I'd we'll love read to, I'd love to read, read more about that. Um, well, yeah, I don't remember exactly what you guys did that, but yeah, you can. Awesome. You guys can talk to We'll look at it and we'll put it in the show notes. notes. Yeah, for sure. sure. Are yeah. there um, are there any, uh, can you, off the top of your head, are there any studies you've gone into where you expected, totally expected one thing? You're like, ah, I'm going to study this, but this is going to happen. And you come out and you're like, what? This is the opposite of what I thought. All the time. Oh, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's science. Like, if I knew the answer, we wouldn't do the study. Mm. Yeah. Right, like there's no point in science is the fact that you don't know what's going to happen. Can you recall any? Yeah, what's the most recent like? Well, it doesn't have to be recent, but something that you learned that you're like, well, that's shattering. the fucking opposite of what I thought. Well, like paradigm shattering is, is pretty difficult to do with one study, you know, because sure. if you find something that's counterintuitive to what you thought, like the first reaction is like, oh shit, did we screw something you gotta, up? Yeah, you got to do it again. Like, did it get contaminated? Like, yeah. did we do this wrong? Do we miss something? Is something wrong? And you go back and you comb through the data. Um, one of the ones that jumped out on us maybe... Uh, well, the one that's jumping out to me, this is a bit of a stretch. This is quite a while ago, but uh, I wasn't on this paper, but I was in the lab. When I was a graduate student, we worked on a study um, with a world record holder in the 100-meter hurdles and I think 60-meter hurdles, something like that. And we wanted to look at fiber type, and so they biopsied him. And the way that fiber type works is you, you got slow twitch and fast twitch, right? Sure. But it's actually far more complicated there's, there's than that. There's type 2A, type 2B. And, no such right? thing as 2B. Really? No. Oh fuck! Humans don't have that's a not that's like thirty year old nonsense. Oh shit! You're so far behind. Bro. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, this is great. So uh, no, you don't have old bees. ass but shit. But what about yeah. the idea that the uh, that slow twitch can adapt and start acting more like fast twitch and vice versa? Yeah, yeah. In fact, again, Jimmy's done the vast majority of it. Okay. He has a review article okay. on this one where like it's very clear you can go from fast to slow and slow to fast. Okay. Like that happens in both directions, and you have actually pretty extreme plasticity. 
Um, I, I go through this a lot, but we've seen... Uh, now, does that mean that they change? For example, we know fast twitch muscle fibers have the most uh, propensity for hypertrophy. They have the, the biggest potential for growth. If they start, if you get slow twitch to start mm, behaving like fast twitch... I don't know if that's necessarily fair. Is that true? Depends. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily true either. Really? And, and they're not You're necessarily... You're blowing my mind today, dude. The fast twitch fibers aren't necessarily always bigger either. I think you've actually shown pretty clearly they're they're usually about the same, mm, depending wow. on how you treat. You guys gonna do what? a whole episode on just like this yeah, with Jimmy? Fuck me, because uh, yeah, he's gonna just ruin you the whole day. <laughs> like, all this shit. Wow, oh, this is man. fantastic. Yeah, this is what he really does. He's um, shaking his head. No, these are smart guys. I can tell. That's yeah, he's <laughs> just being nice. No, um, then there are a lot of inherent characteristics. So the fibers, for example, a slow twitch fiber can get faster. And it can take on fast twitch properties. It can also change to be a fast twitch fiber. Um, those are not those are not common. In fact, that happens like pretty regularly. And the opposite. There was a paper that came out uh, a year ago that showed a uh, high fat, high sugar, high fat, high carbohydrate diet can change fiber type. Wow! Whoa. And resveratrol can counteract that. And we've actually just finished a couple. So of resveratrol studies. is what they have. In, they find in red wine. Yeah, but you is it high ass doses though, or is it? Dude, it's like a you... case of wine. Okay, so it's uh, not like I'm going to take the supplement. It's completely garbage. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, you'd have to like. If you're using that excuse to drink wine and eat chocolate every night, like... It ain't going to happen. No. Okay, good. You're, you're I'm glad you off. said that. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's very, very, very plastic. In fact, that's what Jimmy and I have done more than about anybody is just make this case for... If you look at the data... In fact, there was one study that came out looking at uh, carbohydrate... Or sorry, CO2 concentration, carbon dioxide concentrations, altered fiber type. So you have a lot of mechanisms. They're very, very, very plastic. Um, the, we just finished a 10-day study where you basically put one leg up on... A, in a cast, basically, for 10 days, and we looked at the soleus, and it looks like nothing really shook there. But we see it happen as little as days, sometimes a week. Uh, what's the shortest one you're aware of in maybe like bed rest study? Like two weeks, maybe? Yeah, space flight, a little over two weeks. Yeah, a little over two weeks, fiber type changed with laying in bed for two weeks. What does that change? What does that change look like from fast to slow because you're in bed? Slow to fast. Slow, slow to, to fast. fast. Opposite of what you think, too. Same thing with aging. Well, sorry, the opposite. That's your body yeah. trying to adapt and become efficient, even though you're trying to send it an opposite signal then, right? But that's fucking fascinating. Wow. That is, that's amazing. Wow. Metabolically conservative as well, energy wise. And wow. then when you get so there's God, a there's a faster end. So you have one and two A, right? One being slow, two A being fast. Right. And two X are mega fast. Uh, but we don't ever find two X until like you're on deathbed kind of thing. Or you haven't literally have not had a muscle activated for a decade. Like which is spinal cord which, injury. So yeah, like which that. means if you're trying to activate those, you, you know, you're and not going to get stronger. If you have any, as soon as you do anything, they're gone. Like they go away. They convert away. So, now, how do you look at them and determine? I mean, this is probably a complicated uh, question, but is it okay? No, we take a biopsy. Uh, okay. So we take a muscle sample. Um, we take it out, and we literally, you can check either of our Instagrams. Uh, like we post videos of this all the time. Like you go into the microscope with the tweezer, and you just pull them out one by one. And then you take each one, run it through a little experiment, and put it under his laser and measure it. And Is it? On. Oh, wow. Fascinating. Yeah. Now, what about, let's talk about- so He actually, know, sorry, like, don't forget your question. Oh, yeah. But he has, uh, he has a really cool thing he's building right now where you, he has a, a tiny, tiny, tiny force transducer, and he can lay the, the muscle fiber in this little tiny dish, tie one end with like a rope, and put the other end in the force transducer and measure exactly how much power, velocity, what? the individual the fiber is. Yeah. on the little what? fiber? Yeah. What? Holy shit. So Jimmy's done, how many of those do you think you've done in your life? Like, That's super cool. Several thousand of those probably wow. are in his life. So. Wow. Now, there's a lot of variables there though, right? Because the CNS might not be firing at the same you know, yeah, well, power. the whole point we do it that way is to take out the central nervous system, to take out connective tissue. Just muscle. Just, Just look at so the muscle. muscle yeah. Good. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. Uh, so let's talk about this for a second. Every, uh, we talk about cool. muscle hypertrophy. That term's actually people should understand. Muscle fibers grow. That's what happens when you lift weights. That's what yeah. you're looking for. What about hyperplasia? Do we have evidence of this? Because I know it's been debated. I know we've seen evidence of it in animals, but maybe not in humans. Or, or what's the deal with that? And hyperplasia, by the way, is you can explain it. Well, it's so the more probably the more correct term is fiber splitting, uh, and the where you'd have one muscle fiber and it would split and become two muscle fibers. So it depends on on who you ask here. Uh, uh, Jimmy and I we have this secret picture that we that he got. Uh, he sent me one day, and it's pretty sure we see muscle fiber splitting, but like for various reasons we weren't able to keep it and save it, um, so we can't do much with it. And our friend Kevin at Kentucky just published a paper recently showing fiber type splitting in this sort of weird animal model. So I'd put it this way, to summarize, I guess. I have no doubt in my mind it happens in humans, in normal humans, no doubt at all. It's just the, the complicated question is, 
what takes why the, how right. how it does like is mm. it, it takes years it of training this. to induce yeah. it. It doesn't happen in probably four weeks of training. Hmm. Either it has to have a huge overload, or it has to be a training stimulus for a very very long time. Is probably what's happening. Um, and probably certain humans and bodies probably do it better than others. Well, which there, is what, I mean, I just I I would speculate to think we see this example in some of these like crazy bodybuilders. Well, like, so that's the, that's the data we have on the bodybuilders. Their fibers are actually really small. They which, just have a lot more. Which of them. suggests Ooh. you know we don't have see we didn't biopsy them when they were ten, and now it's hard to know. But th- it's pretty good evidence to suggest it's probably happening. And and again, Jim, you can hop on this one, but the. The vast majority of the thinking here is uh, there is data out on acknowledged anabolic steroid users, and it looks like they have a lot. Uh, and Jimmy, actually, his his um, uh, specialty is the myonuclei. So the myonuclei are what control your DNA and tell your muscle to grow, shrink, die, and mm-hmm. repair. And, and anabolic steroid use testosterone exogenous uh, specifically can increase that number, which is what controls how much you hypertrophy. So the real thing that determines how much your fiber grows is how many nuclei you have because the nuclei have a certain domain Does space. Does this have to do with satellite cells or is this within? Yeah, satellite cells okay. will turn into the nuclei. Okay, okay. And so that all influences it. Um, and that's really one of the things thought to be the, the real regulator of hypertrophy. Yeah, because I would, because so, so, you know, bigger muscle fibers is great, but then they atrophy. The theory goes, if you get hyperplasia and you have more muscle fibers and you stop exercising, you don't lose those muscle fibers. They may just atrophy, or at least that's how it's sold. I mean, this is your, 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 this is Jimmy's dissertation. So this is his whole line of research is muscle memory. So what happens, retrain, mm. detrain, why is it easier to come why back? Why is it so fast this? to come back the second time? Well, yeah, don't you, don't you guys exactly all think does. that, I mean, again, we're speculating again, but when I look at a bodybuilder who hasn't, you know, fallen off after he's done 20 mm-hmm. years of bodybuilding, like they just have a weird, a different look to them. They don't yeah. look like somebody who's atrophied all the way yeah. down to somebody who doesn't have a lot of muscle. They have this. They I would look- bet my career that if you trained hard like that and did Alan Bellic steroids for 20 years, you're going to go through fiber splitting. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. No, it's gonna be super difficult. Actually, I don't think it'd be that difficult to test if you had some funding. It'd be kind of expensive, but not that difficult. But I, I, I don't know how I, would you get approval for that. Hey, we're gonna take these subjects and put them on high doses of anabolics. Well, if if they years. choose to do it, you just do it retroactively. Say, hey, if any of you were doing this, enroll in my study. Oh yeah, retroactive. Mm. Yeah. No, a pro. I, you could do proactive. Say, hey, if you're planning on doing this, let me know. And we'll collect your biopsy. I'm wondering if uh, grow, how 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 much uh, growth hormone plays an influence because growth hormone causes everything or most things to grow, and if that would promote. Yeah, but more. growth hormone is not anabolic, so you have to be careful there. But it, it, does it change the environment to make things? It like could. It certainly is related with IGF one and things like that. Insulin. Mm-hmm. There's a relationship mm-hmm. there. Um, but the the exact role of growth hormone in the anabolic process, especially in endogenous concentrations, is really difficult to get. Mm-hmm. Um, and we actually have a paper on that. We published like the the false understanding of growth hormone and, and what it doesn't actually do. It's not an anabolic steroid. Um, it's it's entirely different type of, of steroid. So that's not to say there's no relationship there, especially with body composition. Uh, it it's it activates fat. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a meta- metabolic hormone for more than anything. Well, I know bodybuilders will say growth hormone doesn't do anything unless you take it with a lot of testosterone. Complementary with and, testosterone, and exactly. insulin. They'll, they'll play with insulin with right. it. Right. So there's a relationship there, but it in itself, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest it would activate satellite cell. I don't think so. Um, that doesn't, maybe it just hasn't been done yet. But mm, interesting. it doesn't mean it doesn't do anything. It just mm. doesn't do that. Okay, so uh, we get asked this question all the time. We have a pretty solid stance on it, but I want to ask your opinion on... I hope I disagree with it so much. Yeah. That'd be so fun. <laughs> solid yeah. opinion. I don't know. Like, buddy. I want to argue with you guys so bad right yeah. now. Yeah. I just yeah. want some spice here. Yeah, it's so boring well, all time, I, this whole episode. <laughs> who did you Come vote, on, yeah. man. Who did you <laughs> vote <laughs> for in the last election? Let's yeah, not yeah, you go that one. Yeah, yeah, let's go there. Don't touch that. We're in California, bro. Yeah, don't touch that. So uh, uh, what I was going to ask you is your opinion on uh, these new class of drugs that are coming out, uh, selective ad- androgen receptor modules, SARMs. SARMs. Yeah. What is your opinion on them so far? Have you looked into them enough to even have one? I don't even have a remotely educated opinion on it. Okay. So okay. I, I can't speak Damn it. until- I like later. you to speculate on things you're not that educated. Yeah, just start <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to get some debate and have some fun. Stuff we got, on the wall. We got to talk I mean? some shit about stuff we don't know. Like, like any that. true person on a podcast, the majority of what you talk about is supposed to be things you don't know about. So, exactly. Like, this is why we yeah. podcast, right? <laughs> Let's give, we, give, we give relationship we'll advice. figure it out by the end, dude. <laughs> we talk yeah. about spirituality. Like all the shit that we don't oh, know yeah. about. We're experts. I don't know anything about that. Yeah, we just, we tell people basically like- 
fucking who knows and why would you mess with anything you don't know what the right take testosterone if you take anything because at least you yeah know that like that works pretty damn well you've seen yeah. that yeah well wow. yeah, yeah. I, i'm i mean i go back to like the dime on a dollar in this one like i don't deal with that because the vast majority of people that i work with don't have that option right because mm-hmm. they're they're all under usada or wada like so mm-hmm. like they help me at all and me personally um with my website and the people i deal with those are not the conversations I want to have. I want to have the conversations more that are like, again, are you having a decent relationship with your own self here? And why are you exercising? And are are you, are you exercising? Are you sleeping? Like, let's get that shit. And then when you get to that level, like go hire somebody else. Like I, I don't want to do those things. So, so let's, let's not that talk I'm against them. Like, like uh, ethically, I'm not against it at all. I just like, I think that's actually cool shit. I just I don't want to. Spend I, the time we today. we agree a lot on yeah. this because Dude, we, we have, like, yeah, yeah we have a very similar we point agree. of view, and so I would like to hear. Um, and you probably outlined this in your book. What what are the the big rocks that you like when someone asks a question like the, the stupid anabolic window question or something yeah. that's you know oh should I have thirty or fifty grams of carbs before my workout to maximize you know what I'm saying yeah before all of that bullshit what are you telling people like okay give me it your- just depends on you know like it depends on why they're coming to me. So if it's a professional athlete versus, you know, my mom asking for advice or something, these are going to be entirely different. Well, let's let's talk about build muscle or lose fat since that's a majority of people. Average guy, average got some experience. average male or yeah. female yeah. wants to either build muscle or both. They yeah. most people want to have a little more mass, muscle, lose some muscle. So body what I actually do is a little bit different um, and you probably I think I explained this on the Rogan's podcast. Um I I try to do my best to communicate to that person in a way that they like to be communicated to. And I think this is one of the things that makes high level coaches very successful. If you look at guys like Brett Bartholomew and like he spends a tremendous amount of time doing things like this. And I think it's very good. I just bought his book. Yeah. It's solid, right? I haven't read it yet. I'm going to start reading conscious coaching, right? Like he could have done a little bit better job copy editing, but you know, that's (laughs) no, it's a great book. Um, but he, he takes the responsibility of saying like, it's my job. Instead of saying like, this is my, my way of the highway. This is how I run my ship. I get on or get off. He goes, how do you like your ship run? Okay, well then I'll I'll, I'll, sh- I'll run the ship that way. Right? And, and so one of the ways I do this with nutrition especially is I like to think about people in three categories. I call them either a chef, a baker, or a cook. And do you know the difference between cooking and baking? No, tell me. Nobody knows? I know you know because you saw the episode. We right? get baked remember? sometimes. Yeah. I don't remember. <laughs> Same thing. Wrong kind of pr- guys. We are in California. But come on now. <laughs> tell us cooking and baking. We tell did. me the difference between cooking and baking. So it's chemistry, right? Yeah. So if you bake something, it, it is very clear instructions, very clear list. You cannot deviate. Like you can't be like, oh, is that a quarter tablespoon or a uh, teaspoon? Okay, good point. Right? Mm-hmm. Cooking, you're kind of oh, a little dab of this, sure. try a little bit of that. Okay. Exactly, right? So you get the analogy. And so the first thing I try to do, whether I physically ask that question or if I just do something to get to that answer, is I try to figure out, like, well, is this person a cook or a baker? Do you want to know exact detail, timing, order, volumes, or do you want just some ideas and some concepts to work with? Hmm. And then I'm going to have that discussion based on that those parameters. So, for example, when somebody goes, some people that are OCD, right? It's like, oh, my gosh, if they don't know, like my wife, when we first started, I started working with her nutrition on her. It was like, like, hold on, like I get a text, like you didn't, you didn't specify how many almonds. Was it eleven almonds or was it twelve? Like I need to know. Is this? What do you mean by handful? Your hand, my hand's bigger than your. Like, what? Did you what? Mm-hmm. She's absolutely a baker. Like she wants exact detail, and she gets anxiety when she doesn't have that detail, which causes her problems, right? And she's not happy. She's not comfortable. She's not sleeping. She loses confidence. All these problems happen in the program, and she doesn't have tremendous detail. I am much more of a cook. I'm like, you give me that much detail, I get anxiety. I'm not bringing a scale with me at all times. I'm not going to weigh how many ounces of, mm-hmm. of cream went in there. Like, I hate that. Give me concepts and ideas, and I want to figure out and feel things, and I want to match progress to to sensation, right? So I, first thing I do is try to put them in a position where they succeed. And then, for the most part, I like John Berardi's model, his three-step approach, which is step number one, add. Add things like fix deficiencies. Mm. Oh, you're not eating enough water. You're not getting enough fiber. We're not getting enough. And so the first step of the, of the diet is adding a bunch of shit. Oh, I like that. That's what mm-hmm. yeah, Adam talks about that all the time. Right. And look what happens to the relationship. Like that, you came to me to be on a diet and you just gave me a bunch of extra shit I get to eat. I trip yep. people out every single time I do that. I look at their diet for a week and I go, okay, now I want you to add this into your diet. We're not yeah. getting, you know, oh God. It's, right. It's amazing. Yeah. Right. And then all of a sudden they feel better and all these things get better and they're much more excited to do a diet when they're like, I get it. Like you're making me feel way better. This is amazing. Whatever the hell you want to do now, I'll do it. I'm in. So step two is take stuff away, reduce things. And then step three is fine tuning supplements. I all that stuff. But usually, honestly, by the time you get to step three, they're gone. 
Right. Which is great. Like they get it. Yeah. They you don't need you. They anymore, take off with it. Which yeah. is ideal from yeah. my perspective, right? I like that. That's the, great. The, the cook, the yeah. cooker, or it's a, a baker. good analogy. Yeah. yeah. So here's the fun part. What's a chef? Dude, like the master, then like the person who teaches all the above. They know when to bake and when to cook. And they can they can break the rules uh, of baking. Uh, yeah. I understand the chemistry so much I can break that rule. <laughs> uh, I like that. Yeah. But here's the problem. Everybody wants to step in day one and be a chef. Oh, yeah, no. Mm-hmm. Like, chef I want to know my chef. Like, takes years of cooking and baking before you're a chef. Exactly, right? Come on. Years. That's why it's a great analogy. So if you walk in trying to be a chef and you're worried about mixing your timing of your nootropic and everything lined up with the, the now you're trying to be a chef and this is your first, and this is day one in sous chef school and you're going to wow. learn how to cut bell peppers I'm first. so stealing this. Spend a year. So stealing uh, this analogy. And then gone. Yeah. 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 Every, we won't air this episode, so they'll think <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, it'll yeah. sound like we'll, brilliant. We'll do, yeah. we'll do one we'll before. Like, knowledge bomb. <laughs> like, we, yeah. we, just, we just came up with an analogy. <laughs> Some doctor. I don't yeah. know. Oh, there goes Andy talking about yeah. my analogy again. There's yeah. a whole episode in our podcast about that, too. Oh, to, yeah. <laughs> to go fuck yourself. You're yeah. <laughs> Been out for eight months. <laughs> yeah. We'll That's how I like it. And so the thing is, that analogy extends to the rest of your life, too. And what I mean by that is, like when it comes to nutrition, I am absolutely a cook. Like I, I hate all that kind of detail, but in science, I'm a massive baker. And when I give public talks, I'm a baker. Like I, I want complete creative control. Every single, where Jimmy and I will spend hours going over like the final word in a document. I want tremendous detail on those things. When it comes to like my financing, I'm like, oh, I'm a cook. Just like, can I just give somebody else to do it? Like, I don't want detail mm-hmm. there. But when it comes to my workouts, like I am now back in baker mode because I, this is like what I do. So I'm passionate about it. We've been doing this our whole life, right? So I think it's, it's, it's fine to acknowledge, like, even if you're not, it's not a good or bad. Like, these are not, these are features, not bugs, right? It, so don't, if, if you're like thinking, like, I guess it's better to be a baker. Or it's better to be, no, it's not. None of these are better. Right. It's just put yourself in a position to succeed. Right. And don't give yourself unrealistic expectations. Understand yourself. Yeah. And wow. if you don't try and, and I'll switch back and forth. Like one of the, several of my athletes, I will do, I'll, I'll talk to them like uh, cooks most of the time, but then when something, something's going wrong, they want that extra little level of detail. Now I switch into bakering up mode and mm-hmm. I might have one conversation and we'll go into baker mode for two or three weeks. We're weighing, we're cutting everything. We're titrating stuff out, fix the problem. Okay, cool. Now let's retract. And I generally feel when someone starts, a nutrition program, start them off like a cook, give them very few rules, a couple of things, get them early success. They're probably then going to gravitate into baking for a little bit, but cooking is far more sustainable for most of us. Oh yeah. Mm. Co- cooking, cooking is, is really, you become more intuitive with things, I think, or at right. least with the, when you're a chef, right. but you're absolutely right because this is true with training too. Like people will see the latest technique that this athlete did where he's sprinting with a parachute and he ran this particular angle for this yeah. time and oh he's the fastest guy in the world that's what i'm going to do and it's like no he didn't do that for the majority of the time he trained that's right. what he does now because he's now learned how to become that chef yeah exactly and you can flip back and forth between those things like so for example if you're sustainability wise i think cooking is a better approach but then if you've got a competition in six weeks or you gotta bake yeah now let's go into baker mode because now we've crunched down details we've we've we're really tight here and we're not wondering why we're not hitting our goal because we know like hey we're we're 28 grams of carbs too high we got to bring that down by 15 grams we're in a lifestyle that's not going to fucking matter mm, yeah. but you're trying to get on stage or you're trying to compete with something you're trying to make weight that detail matters it's just not sustainable for most of us for long periods of time so now we recede and go great job baking you dialed it in you got real good we got there now let's take it back a little bit and let's make nutrition not control so much of our lives. And we're just going to hit these same concepts and the diet might not change hardly at all mm-hmm. between those. But now we've just changed the energy that we're putting into it and the way that we're approaching it. So we can switch back and forth between those things. Excellent. That was an excellent analogy. Yeah. I love that. That's beautiful. So cool. uh, looking forward, uh, what excites you? What do you What do you see the new frontier looking like when it comes to Well, training? probably the thing I'm most excited about right now um, are like threefold. Number one, the stuff Jimmy and I are working on. And um, Irene, I mentioned her a little bit. She's doing some really cool studies. We're trying to collect biopsies from as many people as we can at the American Open because that's in Anaheim, which is like five miles from my lab. Oh, awesome. Sweet. We No one's actually ever studied muscle uh, from any elite speed or power guy or girl. So we're really excited to start looking at female. And Irene's doing some really crazy stuff with that, um, that post-exercise anabolic window stuff. And we want to start doing that in women because again, we just know nothing about physiology and mm-hmm. muscle of, of women. So that's those those two are pretty exciting. And then my website that I'm about to like officially sort of launch, which is the thing that I'm probably most passionate about, 
um, which is just a website where I'm taking all of my university lectures, all this type of stuff that I've created, and just throwing it up on there, and it's totally free. That's awesome. And you have a question. There's no newsletters. That's there's no awesome. membership. It's just like straight up free. Being being that you're kind of like a, a cook probably most of the time with your food, supplementation, things like that, what are some things, uh, whether it be supplementation or hacks that you that you utilize? And I know that you probably don't do anything religiously because you probably don't believe in that, and I agree. Yeah. What are some of the things that you do find do help you? Well, honestly, like this is going to be the least sexy part because it's generally the basic stuff. So uh, with the athletes and stuff, generally it is creatine. Like creatine is very, very effective for a lot of things. Jimmy just came out with a paper actually uh, this this week, this came out, uh, looking at the cognitive benefits of creatine supplementation. Oh, yeah. Especially mm-hmm. with vegans. Vegans have the biggest uh, IQ boost with it, well, probably because they eat. This is, yeah, this is all in his paper, right? Mm-hmm. Like this just came out. It's like, yeah, like this is a problem. So the creatine is one of my go-to ones, right? Um, if they have, depending on how they eat, uh, increasing variety of food is often a real problem sustainably because they get in these habits of like, this worked last time, I'm going to do this and mm-hmm. keep eating this for 12 years. All right, probably not a great thing. Um, protein powders, depending uh, on what they're doing, are carbohydrate supplements. Beta alanine, caffeine, like the very, the very standard ones are, are generally... I generally don't feel like I have to go much beyond the very, very basic stuff. Not, not to say we don't, because we will, but those are, when the situation really demands it and we're searching for answers, mm-hmm. we're going to go looking for things like that. But if, if I don't feel like we have to answer that question, I mean, I've used everything from vitamin C to iron to vitamin D, like anything I'll use if the blood work or some other marker is coming back and this is the problem. Right. Zinc, like all of it, I mean, I've used echinacea, like you, you name it, like I've tried it if, if a situation came up. Mm. Right, right. I, I mean, I use vitamin, I have psoriasis, so I use vitamin D for that purpose, you know, mm-hmm. but for the most yeah. part, I think we're the same way as far as how we yeah. use supplements. Well, like, that's a good one, too, because, like, I don't know if you saw Graham Close's new paper on vitamin D, but it's like, it turns out we've been measuring that in the lab wrong. Mm. Oh, wow. So, Explain. now we need to rethink all of vitamin D. Mm. Like, you could get false, like, oh, Like, the this... vast majority of the field, all the science, all the blood behind it is all now, like, looks like we're measuring the wrong thing entirely. You know what's, whoa, in- oh, so, so, you know what's interesting about this is, uh... That's not to say it doesn't help your psoriasis, but like, yeah. you know, like well, it's it clear, could be, working, it's working. Yeah. Well, it could yeah. also mean that they measure you in the normal level, but you're not necessarily getting totally. the normal You don't know. Or the Which, opposite. And this is why, this is one of the mistakes I think Western medicine made, but it's starting to change, is where they only look at numbers and a lot of times they ignore symptoms. So it's like, sure. well, I know you have all the symptoms of low testosterone, but your testosterone numbers look normal. So it's not your testosterone when it could be, you know. It could be receptor down re- regulation. Yeah. It could be all kinds of things. Um, so it's important to look at. So I'll give you a good vitamin D example. Um, I did some blood work maybe a year ago or something, came back low of vitamin D like all of us have, right? Well, first of all, it's really difficult to figure out what that even means because low relative to what? Mm-hmm. Like where are they getting these standardized numbers from? They're, they're not good places, by the way. Mm. So young, healthy, fit guys like us, I don't know where we're supposed to be. <clears throat> I don't know what a normal number is, but it came back low. So I could have supplemented with vitamin D. Instead, I chose like, well, where are we supposed to get vitamin D from? This to me is a signal that my lifestyle is not appropriate. I need to make a lifestyle change. Rather than fix the, the blood marker, the symptom, let's fix the lifestyle. Go outside. Right. Yeah. I live in Southern California right. and I have low vitamin D. Right. Like that's a- Shame on you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, get outside. But here's, the, here's why I love telling the story because the vitamin D wasn't the problem. I didn't feel tired. I wasn't having a hard time growing muscle mass or have any of these problems. I felt fine. But- I use that as a way of going, okay, I need to get outside more. So I started going outside and taking more of my calls outside and walking my dogs. And I've got two shepherd mixes. And if you know anything about dogs, like they are very, very smart and they require a shit ton of energy. I don't have the time. They need two, three hours of exercise every day, like to not tear up my house. So they started getting an extra walk of an hour or so a day. So I fixed my vitamin D. Great. The dogs also started getting more exercise, which meant I have to spend less time specifically taking time out of my day to exercise them, which meant less shit went wrong in my house, which meant more free time for my wife and I, which meant we got to talk more. We got to spend more time, which is always a problem in our relationship, right? Oh, and then also, do you know how many ideas and problems I solved because I was out walking for an hour? Mm -hmm. How many more additional conversations? Like all these other things happened that would have never happened if I would have just taken vitamin D. Mm -hmm. That's why I think like supplements are good in, in a case where I need a quick fix for something or other here, but the lifestyle change is where it needs to get to because all these fringe benefits that came from fixing the lifestyle 
That's really what happened. This is a pro- This is something they talk about in economics all the time. Well, they'll say, oh, we passed this policy. Look at these jobs that we gain. And people yeah. are like, well, we don't know how many we would have gained without that policy. For sure. Or we don't know all of the unintended consequences. Or we don't know... You know what you could have happened because of the new process they're doing. Just like you're exa- you're, you're explaining yeah. right now, I mean that's a brilliant uh, way of putting it, and I hope it makes sense to people, or at least it, it inspires people a little bit uh, yeah. when they're trying to solve their health problems. No, it's whatever. the exact same way that I actually I remember when Sal was the one who actually shared the the Harvard study with me of the the correlation that was found between everybody that had uh, psoriasis and it was like 90% had a vitamin D deficiency. So I thought, well, fuck, I've never supplemented. Let me try that. And I thought, that's crazy that no one said that to me. And there was something that I, I remember very, very clearly. Uh, I grew up on the lake, uh, outdoors, sports, everything. Mm-hmm. I was outside if, to the point where my skin complexion is completely different than what it was when I was a child. I was like mm. dark, dark, all as a kid. You were so up. much more handsome then. Yeah, it was, definitely. I knew it. Hard then, to now believe, that's why you're reading huge penis Right, right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> then I, then I, right, right around 20, I get into the gym, the gym and fitness industry. Yeah. And I'm working in a gym, you know, eight to 10 hours from morning. I'm there by six, seven in the morning when the sun's barely coming up. And I don't, don't see sun all day right around 24 25 years old all of a sudden psoriasis comes up in my life mm-hmm. never had it before didn't even know what the fuck it was when it came on and then been battling it my whole life no clue that it could be connected to vitamin d sunlight yeah. or any of those things i Try had a that. really bad realization maybe three years ago because uh, your first couple of years when you get a professor job like it, it's pretty intense in terms of workload and i was like i'm living in southern california i was single and i'm not seeing the sun because I'm in my office before the sun comes up and I'm there until the sun goes down. And I'm like, I, it was like a crazy stretch, like three months and I had not seen the sun. And I was like, oh my God, like this is not, <laughs> this is not a good thing. Right. But, and that's a lot, that, that other story too is the re- another reason why I wrote the book. I'm like, man, we, we've got to figure out like these should be signs of fixing lifestyle right. and, and getting back to physiology has a really interesting way of, of fixing itself when you let it. Mm-hmm. And you just get out of its way. Hmm. Like, listen to what it's telling you. It's not telling you take a vitamin D stuff. I mean, look at the backlash we had on, on fish oil. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. It's like, ah, oh, take 28,000 eight grams a day. No, it's like, well, maybe, okay, maybe, maybe we shouldn't have been doing that. Yeah. That might be inflammatory. Good for yeah. You. I, it's like people wearing blue blockers at night because they're trying to stop the blue light when it's like, dude, just take turn off your electronics. Maybe that. <laughs> maybe you need to turn maybe, off maybe your electronics. Try that first, <laughs> yeah. An hour right. before you go to bed. Yeah, know? exactly. Or whatever. Right. Those, those are classic examples of, of things that uh, blue blocker, great, but. Let's improve the lifestyle. And, and so the creatine example, especially for vegans and boosting their IQ, I use that example for vegans all the time to tell them like, they see, like you can measure IQ boost with vegans for sure, not always necessarily with omnivores. What do you think that te- mm-hmm. s- tells you about your diet? Yeah. That you may be lacking something because you're not eating, you know, something that we, maybe we need. Right. But and B12, a bunch of other problems. Oh yeah, other, like th- other stuff yeah. too. Yeah. Creatine's an interesting one though too because now they're finding uh, it's got an interesting impact on the Leydig cells, I think, of the testicles. and Oh, Leydig cells, yeah. Yeah, and it may have seen some interesting effects on uh, androgen receptor density and you know stuff like that. Pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. We've done some work on the beta adrenergic receptors. Um, I don't think we've ever done it in relation to creatine, but we did that with uh, short-term overtraining. Mm. So uh, this is like 10 straight days of doing 10 sets of one of 100% of your max back squat. Mm. And if you didn't get a successful lift, like it didn't count. So you just keep, okay, so you just, so you're, kept, you're you definitely kept, overtrained. You get 10, yeah, you short term, you do it like 10 straight days or 14 straight days. And then you look at beta adrenergic receptors. We just published a couple of these studies recently. I'm uh, looking how those density go way down in as short as, as 10 days. Which, wow. is, which is super fun. Wow. So, what, wow. What does it mean when that density goes down? So then you're going to be less, far less sensitive to the anabolic signal. Mm. Right, because that's what testosterone is going to bind to in the cell, and that's going to communicate then to the nucleus. Wow. So that goes way down. And that's, I mean, that's how plastic your body is. Like muscle, it just it's mm. everything you do matters. So mm-hmm. this is similar to what we would, what we kind of call the recovery trap, right? Where someone's been kind of hammering themselves so hard for so long, and they just can't they just go in and out, in and out, recover, but you know, hammer, recover, hammer. Mm-hmm. When they're not building, they're just recovering. And oh hammering, yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. know, just getting Repairing back, damage, yeah. just yeah. getting yeah. sore and getting better. Yeah. Well, fuck, man. Love having you on the show, brother. It's fun. It's yeah. exciting it's fire, knowing that man. you're right up. You're coming over here all the time. From now on, whenever you're listen, uh, every time you're up here, I want you to 
message one of us and we'll get you on the show. We could do guests. Uh, we could have a, like you help. Uh, You'd be uh, great for Q&A. We trust, yeah, we could do we Q &A trust you to answer questions. <laughs> oh, I don't yeah. think you guys want that. Yeah, it's a yeah. small and circle. We, got, we invite. And we got the whole facility here. <laughs> if you, you know, you talked about the business side. If you yeah. need help creating media You hate or whatever, that side. We, I love that we side. Do. So I got yeah, you. Yeah. Well. That's so, what well, we do, man. I just want to show up with my shirt off looking like that guy. Yeah. You guys do the rest. Who's that? That's Sergio Olivia. Adam, you got to keep your shirt on. You have to go out in the sun a bit more there. I one, think. one of the few guys yeah. to beat Arnold Schwarzenegger in bodybuilding, and then Arnold beat him ever yeah. since. A bunch of times. A right? bunch of times, yeah. yeah. He shouldn't have, though. He should have beat Arnold every single time. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but those pecs, man. How do you say no to those Arnold pecs? Right. Yeah. yeah, that's it. It's yeah. tough yeah. to walk away Powerful. from. Powerful. Well, excellent, yeah. brother. Check it out. Go to YouTube. Subscribe to Mind Pump TV. There's a new video every single day. Check out the one we posted today. It's going to blow your mind. Also, mindpumpmedia.com. That's our website. Go on there. Register for 30 days of coaching. It's available for free. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.